Inflation should be going down. The economy is slowing. Not expecting a massive pickup in inflation, but I think it's way too early to be calling victory laps. We will and should still expect to see over the next several quarters a continued slowdown. This is what the Fed wants. We hope they only hike one more time. They probably shouldn't do that. They could declare mission accomplished, except that's a jinx. So it's better that they don't do that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Wall Street earnings this hour, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market slightly negative by 0.1% on the S&P. Before today, though, quite a run, a four-day winning streak on the S&P 500. We're calling it the everything rally here at Bloomberg. Stock's doing well, bonds <sighs> doing well. Yields this week on a two-year TK down 28 basis points. Yeah, that's a huge move. It's a correlated move as well. I know we're going to talk a lot about foreign exchange. Stephen Englander with his game changer phrase to join us. I think that's maybe the interview of the day. I'm going to call it, John, ATH July. That's what we're talking I haven't seen this in, it was been three years. It's ATH July. It's what all, on earth does that mean? All time high July. If you're Obviously. in, John, if you're in the American zeitgeist, <laughs> If you're in the American zeitgeist of equity guys, particularly if you right. miss the, the rally, you call it ATH, which is all-time high. Okay. We're coming up on all-time high. Standard & Poor's 500. How close are we to a record? 6% away. 6%? Maybe 7%. Okay. Who's coming? All right. well, you're calling on that an all-time high. Standard & Poor's 500. So if you're within 7%, we get to call that all-time That's what's happening highs. this Friday when the bears capitulate. 7% moves today. That's quite cool. No, not today. July <laughs> is a blended basis. Okay, can I elaborate a little bit? Maybe where you're going with this is the fact that we heard from Ed Yardeni yesterday that we could get to 4,800. We heard You've been from so kind Goldman right now. Sachs, John Fla I'm trying to save it, okay? Uh, we've heard from Goldman Sachs <clears throat> strategists that we could get to all-time highs Calvacina this year. raised earnings. Calvacina raised her earnings per share target. This is the melt-up and the revisions upward that we are seeing towards mm. potential all-time highs not necessarily in July, but by year end. Friday calculus moment. Is it a melt up? It doesn't feel like a melt up because it's sort of correlated with dollar. You know, there's like movable parts going on here. Catching up with Laura Calvacina a little bit later from RBC. I, I just had the a back of that upgrade. Move. So looking forward to that. Could you be the first speaker at Purdue Business School for James Bullard? I think we should Jay go Green. as a show. You take the, the show. Would you She's like to explain to the audience who might have missed that news <laughs> why you're bringing up Jim Bullard? Bullard, Bullard, who I respect immensely of the St. Louis Fed, is retiring after 33 years at the Fed. He's going to Purdue. Where's that? Indiana. Indiana. Thank you. Good for him. He's going to, we should take the show there. You know. Mr. Waller, his former head of research at the St. Louis Fed, making some headlines, now governor on the board of governors at the Federal Reserve, looking for two more hikes this year. That seems to be the consistent message from the Federal Reserve this week, even with PPI softer, CPI softer, a whole range of data points pointing potentially, and I stress potentially, towards a soft landing. And yet still, Lisa, these Fed officials looking for more. And markets saying, Chris Waller, we know you're trying to jawbone us into raising rates so that we tighten financial conditions. We don't buy it. He's going to have a hawkish message. The market is basically shrugging it off and saying, this is the message you're going to have until you cut, and you will cut at some point. Equities right now, slightly negative. JP Morgan results this hour. Bramo's going to go through what you need to watch over the next couple of hours through this morning in just a moment. In the equity market, then slightly negative. Yields just a little bit higher after quite a run on a two-year and a 10-year through most of this week. We're up two basis points to 378. That euro move, though, that euro move, six days of euro strength against the US dollar. We're about to snap that streak just and only just. But the euro, Tom, near levels we haven't seen since February of last year. Let's not take a lot of time here, but just as an idea, I went to the idiosyncratic euro Turkish lira. Solid three standard deviation leap. I mean, the strong euro. Did you see sterling? Can we afford London? I, I just don't think so. Brexit's been a complete failure. 130. 131. 112 on yeah. euro dollar right now, Lisa. 112. 25. And we're watching the potential for further dollar weakness. Today, the bank earnings. Here is the schedule around 6.45 a.m. We get J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo kicking off the earnings. Citigroup expected around 8 a.m. The analyst calls uh, start at 8.30 a.m. for J.P. Morgan, 10 a.m. for Wells Fargo, 11 a.m. for Citi. I am curious how much more their expenses to pay depositors, to pay interest, how much more quickly that's rising than the interest they're earning from loans. Today at 10 a.m., we get a read on the University 
Western Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey. We are expecting sentiment to increase. We're looking for the potential for inflation expectations to come down. Soft landing, copacetic, everything's amazing. How much is it going to feed into the everything rally? And today, NASDAQ is going to announce the details around how it's going to rebalance. And this is actually pretty interesting because the NASDAQ 100 has gotten so concentrated in six names that have exceeded 50 percent of the holdings that it may make a problem for some of the fund managers that can't track it legally, according to the SEC. And so they're trying to rebalance it. How do they rebalance? I don't understand this. We will so find we out the details. Now, but I just don't get it. Well, we're going to find out the details of how they plan to rebalance it later to de-emphasize. So they're going to make names. it like the Dow. Is that it, Jen? NASDAQ becomes like the Dow. No, no, no. They're not going to weight it by price. Come time. on. At least, the hope, at least the hope not. If they come up with that a little bit later, Give I think we'll that. all be sorely disappointed. Mm. Steve Chevron, head of multi-asset solutions at Federated Hermes, joins us now. Steve, wonderful to catch up with you. This hour, JP Morgan results, City, Wells Fargo later this morning. What are you and the team looking for? Well, look, I mean, it, we, we do expect some weakness in the bank results, but it's been, you know, well flagged at this point. Um, it, it's not like it's going to come to us as a surprise to anyone. I mean, Goldman's really gone out of their way to lower expectations, and so... You know, the question is, is it, are those earnings, uh, you know, do they do they offer you a pullback in the market? And if they would, you know, we'd, we'd be inclined to want to buy that now because we think, look, it, 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 as cautious as we've been economically, we've held our nose three times already this year and bought going from an underweight position to roughly a 3% overweight in equities. And we're doing it because we think that this rally will, will, will have some legs here. Um, even if storm clouds do materialize on the economic front, which they very well could, we think that's still a ways away and it keeps getting pushed out. And so there's money to be made in the meantime. I, I look, Steve, at the reallocation here. We come in every morning. You know, Lisa's in here at 2 a.m. I slide in at about 5.30, John about 5.45. And all of us see the same thing on the screen. Everybody's adjusting and rationalizing. Do we need yeah. to rationalize to a legit second leg of a bull market? Well, I think it depends on the asset class, Tom, and this is an important distinction. If, if you're looking at fixed income here, right, and, and you, you have some warning signs that are still out there, whether it's the LEIs or the inverted yield curves or what's going on with same store sales, I mean, we, we all know the list. Given where spreads and rates are, you don't want to get aggressive because it's like trying to pick up a penny in front of a tractor trailer. On the equity side, however, if you look at the history, Markets rally during Fed pauses. Now, they'll roll over later, but they, but they rally during Fed pauses. And those rallies can be 10, 15, 20 percent events. And yes, historically, they do get you to all time highs. And so that's you have to play that even if you have uh, a recognition of some of the risks that are out there, because it could take another six, nine, 12 months to materialize, you know, if it materializes at all. And so that's I think what you see going on is this realization that markets tend to fall when the Fed's cutting, so not not while they're still hiking. So given that, Steve, where are you getting more aggressive? Where are you buying? Where yeah. is there money to be made based on the fact that perhaps it's not necessarily in the meme stocks? Yeah, where we've done it is in the small cap growth side, which which seems kind of ironic. But the reason why we've added there, you know, we had a big value tilt through 21. We wanted to get a little bit more into growth. And if you look on a two-year basis, the Russell 2000 growth is still down 20% from where it was just two years ago. Um, it entered its bear market a year before the large caps. You're not dealing with some of the kind of really high-flying valuations like you'd see on NVIDIA. So you get the growth exposure. Uh, it's a little bit cyclical, at least in the short run, which, you know, until the, the music stops playing, that's where you want to be. Um, and the valuations aren't nearly as demanding. And, and that's where we found the best opportunities. It used to be, Steve, that when J.P. Morgan kicked off earnings season, everyone looked at them as a bellwether for what to expect from the rest of companies mm -hmm. who are reporting. Are they still in that role? Will the bank earnings still serve as something as a tea leaf for what we can expect for the rest of the earnings season? Well, well now you're making me feel old because I remember when it was Alcoa that used to kick off the, uh, the earnings season. But that's like a... a, a a decade ago, it seems like. No, I mean, I, I think it, the problem, well, not the problem, but but the issue with J.P. Morgan is, honestly, it's such a well-run company. They've always got something in their, in their bag of tricks to, to kind of beat numbers. So you kind of expect that they're going to do at least okay um, to kick things off. And then as you get through the season with, with some of the banks that maybe, you know, aren't quite as good at setting expectations – you know, you get a better read. Um, I, I think in terms of financials for, for this quarter, it's going to be a, a, a two-pronged story. One, 
you know, how are the big guys doing? And we expect some weakness on the investment banks. Uh, but it's things like credit quality that we're going to be looking for and loan growth, which seems to have grinded to a halt. And then perhaps more importantly, once we get into the regional banks, right. which will be more next week, that, that that's where you really got to be vigilant and see if there's signs of weakness. Yeah, I'm looking, Steve, at where we want inflation to go. And, and you Federate is such an equity house that, that I think the basic idea is, do equity animals want the yield and inflation interest rates to go back to 2%? Or do you do better if it's a little sticky and is a new 3% or 3.5%? That's a great question. It's a debate we have a lot. Um, you know, I think over the long run, equities in general are going to do better at a 2% rate, assuming that that means you've got a nice lower discount rate, right? Um, equity valuations tend to go up with a lower discount rate. I think it, what it really comes down to, though, is what does the Fed do? If the Fed's willing to accept three, that may not be great over the long run. In fact, I think it's not great over the long run. But over the short run, markets will rally on that. Um, if, if they've got to get to two and they're going to continue to hike aggressively, then I think the rally we're seeing ends up being you know, not sustainable. So that's the question. If they accept a higher, stickier number, then this rally could last for, for quite a while. If they're really going to go to two um, and they stick to that, then I think the rally will continue for some time because there's there's really no way to tell when inflation's coming down to a nice acceptable level or it's coming down into a kind of recession level. You don't know uh, until you get there. Um, but if they're really going to go that far and continue to hike, then the, you know obviously the risks of a harder landing you know rise from there. So that's a key question, and you know honestly you'd have to ask Mr. Powell. What he's going to do with it? I'll like do that. I think he's on the nine tournament. o'clock today. He's on the nine o'clock. Well, you guys yeah, get him. I mean, yeah, he's you, on the you, nine you guys today. get all, You got all the Fed superstars. That's huge. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Because, uh, Steve uh, no. Come on. Michelle Smith called up with the Fed and goes, "Who's the guy with the British accent?" Jerome wants to talk to. He him. likes the softballs on sixty minutes. That's yeah. what I hear. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? Those <laughs> fireside chats. What was it like? Could that you moment imagine? when you found out about the pandemic. <laughs> what did you think? I was thinking we have to go to zero and do QE forever. Yes. We have to be bold, brave. It's transitory. Steve, thank you. Steve <laughs> Chevron, Federated. Whoa. Steve, what have you started? It feels better now. Let's see what it feels like in a few months' time. Michael Hartnett says this over at Bank of America. Yeah, interesting. Tough to get to recession when unemployment is 3% and the budget deficit is 9% of GDP. We say 2023 disinflation will prove transitory. It's a different way of using that word. Real rates to rise and nothing below 3% in the Treasury market, Tom, without a very hard Landing. This gets to the point I just asked with Mr. Chevron, and let's be clear here, Steve Chevron is outstanding at these nuances and how they fold into asset allocation. What is our world like and our belief in equities if we get to 3.2%-ish and stop? I don't think that's in the thinking, the zeitgeist. Certainly, it's not in the market right now. The point of a soft landing until it's a hard landing is something a lot of people have been talking about. Uh, Hartnett as well over at Bank of America. But J.P. Morgan's Bob Michael, who is, uh, I know, a friend of Bloomberg, but in a friend of yours, John, came out and said he has more conviction going into duration than he has since the start of the pandemic, because what he is seeing around the world is screaming recession, every sign. And these things can happen very quickly. He is the outlier as everybody else gets more constructive. And so here is the tension. Are people getting perhaps enamored of this head fake, of this disinflation story that may prove to be So in, so in your bond world, does that mean you buy eight-year paper and not three-year paper? It depends of what, right? I mean, it depends if you think okay. that the company can pay it back at whatever rates. Are you talking about credit or treasuries? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> They're all the same. That's, That's helpful. That. Yeah, That's slightly, I different. It slightly different. Slightly different. Thank you. Great interview, and I'm pleased you brought it up with Bob this morning. Bob's still committed to this idea that perhaps you go down to three. 3.0, 3 right across the curve. Two's all the way out to 30s in the treasury market. That would be quite a move still yeah. from where we are. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. I don't know what you're up to this morning. I really don't. Yeah, can I get some more tank? Okay, please, whatever please, that is. Please. Ken Leon of CFRA in the next hour no, on bank results. Zero. JP Morgan later this hour. And then around about 8 o'clock you'll get City from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Jim represents the last of a generation, uh, the pre-crisis uh, Federal Reserve Bank presidents uh, that were very well trained, very well steeped in monetary economics, 
And he was more willing than most to speak out. There's a risk looming of uh, economic weakness. I think it's it's a, a delicate time for central bank leadership. Jeff Lacker there, the former Richmond Fed president, weighing in on the departure of the St. Louis Fed president, Jim Bullard, Tom, from Monetary Policy. To keep this short, because our guest here is so important, this is all geographic folks. This is what they did in J.P. Morgan's library on Madison Avenue. The hinterlands did not trust New York City, so they made many central banks. Lacquer is Richmond, Virginia. Bullard is Indiana University in St. Louis, and they each have a different character. The combination of the two is a conservative research integrity, as witnessed by Waller. And so there is an emotional linkage between Richmond and St. Louis, unlike, say, Boston and Dallas, you don't have the same linkage. What you heard there was someone commenting on how willing Jim Bullard was to speak out. It's not much of that happening right now on the committee. Jim Bullard, I believe, at the St. Louis Fed. The St. Louis Fed doesn't get a vote on the committee until 2025. I, I don't, yeah. So he would have been really, without a vote yeah. for a, a number of years. Well, but ultimately, <clears throat> even without a vote, he's able to make waves sometimes because he talks so much. I've done some really wonderful things with Jim Bullard and had the honor of lunch in St. Louis. But, John, the number one thing to me is when the three of us visit Purdue to speak to Professor Bullard, what's important here is the, the idea of what he thinks of the dots, because he was the outlier dot. A number of years ago. Do you remember yeah. he just put that dot at the bottom and it was like, said, forget about it? He goes, is that a typo on the screen or not? Is it the governor Bullard. of Indiana going to join us? I heard he might. It may, is that Mitch? Yeah. I don't know. We're gonna, Maybe we can get the, the former Vice happen. President Pence. It can be an all-Indiana thing. Pence is going to come along too. Yeah, you know. Nice. Indiana I, I'm not sure any of these people have committed. But Larry will the show. come down. Okay. That we've even asked them. <laughs> going to make this happen. Tons of data through this week. Very and the shocked. data so far fueling hopes and dreams of a soft landing. Standard Charter's Steve England are calling the CPI print earlier this week a game changer for the US dollar. Running the following, we doubt that the Fed will hike again after the July 26th meeting. We think the recent US dollar underperformance reflects a qualitative shift in market comfort with being short US dollar as the terminal Fed policy rate, Tom, looks increasingly capped. For all of you of Global Wall Street, Stephen Englander of the Standard Charter Bank. Stephen, I'm going to cut to the chase and I'm going to go pro question here. If you take DXY or BBDXY, a blended index, you run it on a log Y axis showing percentage change. We have had, say, on DXY, a weak or demonstrably weaker dollar uh, right now. What's the run rate out one year or two year? Can we get scope and scale of on DXY a five or dare I say a ten figure big move? Yes, I, I think that there's a risk. I think markets would have to cooperate. Um, but I think that this is, you know, as I said, kind of like a game changer because the um, it really takes the, the hawkish winds out of the, the Fed sales and the fears of selling dollar and dollars and getting blindsided by uh, the Fed sort of extending the the, C, or the, the terminal Fed funds rate or, or, or hawking up <clears throat> seems far less likely given the nature of the slowing that we've seen in the CPI, which is very, very likely to continue. Somebody um, I yeah. No, go ahead, Steve. Continue, please. Yeah, I, I think what we do need, and, and, and this is why it's such a game changer, I think if, if, you, if you, we start getting weaker um, economic data, sort of payrolls keep on declining, the question quickly comes up, okay, um, you know, the inflation picture looks very benign for a year, maybe a bit longer. Um, the economy is clearly weakening, weakening so monetary policy has worked. Uh, what is the case for keeping rates as high as they are? So I mm -hmm. think that the the fact that the inflation trajectory is is pointing downwards means that there's going to be a lot of sensitivity to any kind of weak economic right. data. I'm going to give credit to Robin Brooks, the great Robin Brooks. But Steve Engler, somebody in the zeitgeist last night, I can't remember, showed trade-weighted euro out to a record high. At what point does strong euro break Germany? At what point does strong euro break an industrial Europe? I don't I don't think Europe's problems are the exchange rate. I, I think Europe's problems are, are, are structural, sort of Germany kind of being 30, 40 years behind the times in terms of the kind of economy that it's had and the type of growth that it's oriented to. Um, it's not an exchange rate problem. And I'd say that the, you know, if you look at the euro against against the dollar, 
Um, you know, it, it's still pretty weak. We're just back to where we were before the Russia-Ukraine war started. Um, I, I think there's more room to go. But I, again, I, I think it's, you know, if nothing changes from here on in, there's some room to go. If things move in the direction of U.S. economic weakness, there's a lot of room to go. If the distinction between disinflation being good and disinflation being bad is to be considered, how do we look at the dollar weakness? In other words, dollar usually weakens in a risk on environment globally. If we have the world's largest economy suffering and the disinflation turns into outright deflation in goods and something more of a downturn, does the dollar still weaken? Um, you know, it, it depends. You say recession and everybody remembers 2008 to 2020 acts of God, lightning bolts, you know, things falling off a cliff. Who remembers 1968, 1970, uh, 1990, um, which is more typical of the kinds of recessions that you have? You know, things are soft. It's moderate softness. Um, the world doesn't come to an end. And I think that that's kind of the kind of recession. It's not your, your hair standing on end. It's just that things are pretty sluggish. Which pair do you think is going to be the most uh, winning one if a, you do have this weak dollar due to the disinflation? If it's not the euro necessarily, is it somewhere in Asia? Where are you looking? Well, Asian currencies have a lot of room to go just because they've been sold off so much. Some of the Asian high yielders at this stage look very, you know, look very attractive. I mean, we, we have, um, you know, Indian yields quite high and, and uh, you know, INR around 82. We have um, uh, IDR with um, Indonesia with yields, you know, high, and it's kind of been one of the weaker currencies over the year. There's a lot of catch-up potential, I think, out of Asia um, on this. But I think even Eastern European currencies look good because they have the carry. Um, Brazil could look very good. I mean, it's, it's, its yields are huge compared to everyone else. And I think what's important is that you go long um, carry now. You, again, you don't have the, or at least you have much less fear of being blindsided by, you know, monetary policy kind of really um, hitting you the way it happened in February and it looked like it was happening, you know, a couple of other times this year. Hey, Steve, wonderful to catch up. Always enjoyed reading your research when it lands in the inbox. Steve Englander there of Standard Chartered on the CPI data this week, what it means for the foreign exchange market. Adam Ruskin of Deutsche Bank, we caught up with him recently. 115 price target on the euro. And writing last night, the current risk to the forecast is that the initial move happens more rapidly than projected. And this move this week, Tom, has happened pretty quickly. It's been a really pretty quickly uh, move. And again, it, 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 and this is something huge advantage of the Bloomberg Terminal folks, is you can look not only at trade-weighted uh, indices of, say, trade-weighted Europe, trade-weighted yen. You can look at the two major indices, the traditional DXY, the wonderful math of the Bloomberg dollar index. But, John, at the same time, you can have 30 pairs. And at least as important question, which pair wins? Wins. That's a raging debate into the weekend. Favourite tweet this week, and you caught this one. Sam Rowe loves Sam stuff. When you ignore all the positive things, things look really bad. It kind of sums up this week, doesn't it? Some of the commentary out there, Tom. Sam, Sam is, is, is someone that people underestimate. This guy's a bulletproof CFA and uh, keeps, you know, he keeps the smartness under his cuff there, but he says wise things at the right time. It's a lot of good things this week, yeah. validating the equity market balls of the year so far. And let's see if that can continue. Coming up very shortly, potentially in the next 20 minutes or so, earnings from JP Morgan as we officially kick off earnings season on Wall Street. From there, it's on to Wells Fargo and City. And then from there, it's into next week, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley and Goldman. Gerard Cassidy of RBC on the banks on Wall Street, up next. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Wall Street earnings just around the corner. JP Morgan in the next 15 minutes or so. Equities going into all of that. Looking like this on the S&P 500. Four-day winning streak on the S&P. Equities a little bit softer. Up every single day this week so far. Monday through Thursday. The Nasdaq down by something like 0.1% on the Nasdaq 100. On the week, up on the week. In the bond market, Treasuries rallying hard this week. The two-year yield on the week so far down almost 30 
basis points, up about three at the moment to 4.66 on a 10-year, down a similar amount. We are up on the session, though, by a couple of basis points to 3.78. In the FX market, the euro getting a ton of headlines. The euro at highs we haven't seen in more than a year. The euro right now, 112. 18. Slightly negative against the dollar, but that has not been the trend over the previous six days, Tom. We've seen stronger euro, stronger euro, stronger euro. It's a game-changing thing. There's no question about it. And, John, I would go away from euro and look at some of the other pairs as well. Forget about idiosyncratic Turkey. It's a mess out to new weakness. But Mexican peso sustains under 17. John, have you seen dollar Swissy and even euro Swissy? With this, I mean, these are stunning numbers. In you Zurich. mentioned Sterling, cable 131. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm just not really sure what they – they're 0.96 on Euro Swiss. You know, John and I were in Zurich when they had to act and try to weaken the Swiss franc. I'm not sure we're there yet, but I'm watching it. It's like in – you know. It's yeah, a, I don't it's think we're like, there yet either, Tom. You're talking about a yeah. week of a, of a bounce back. Let's see if that can continue. Lisa, ultimately what you need is the same kind of data we had this week on repeat. And on repeat and on repeat, so the Federal Reserve That's starts to change gamble. its message. Well I love what Alan Ruskin said, and I love that you brought that up, this idea that the one downside risk is that it happens too quickly, and that seems to be what happens. We price in an entire year's cycle in about three days, and then everyone has to reset. And at what point do people overprice the disinflation? That is sort of the tension right now at a time when it was always expected <clears throat> to disinflate heading into the back end of this year. I wonder how currencies adjust to bank earnings. I mean, you know, PepsiCo and the rest, I get it. It's a like huge currency foreign exchange effect, and now it'll go the other way. But you wonder what the banks will do. Let us begin our coverage here. Elise has been absolutely phenomenal about driving out the importance of Pepsi-Cola, Walgreens a number of days ago. But it starts for real here in 15 minutes. Joining us is the keeper of the thoughts and structures of Manhattan Wall Street and indeed Global Wall Street. Our Bloomberg, who's going to get laid off correspondent, Shanali Basic, begins. I got a lot of fancy bank questions. Forget about it. It's a really strange July in the Hamptons. Basically, grim is the operative word. When does the right sizing begin to get to February rationalization? I'm going to guess right sizing to Labor Day is a big theme. Yeah, I mean, right sizing must continue as long as revenue is under pressure. And if you take a look at each of the banks, JP Morgan alone, trading revenue is supposed to be down by about a billion dollars. And you have investment banking <clears throat> also down. It's the consumer bankers that are doing better in the sense of credit card sales going up and stuff like that. But you do have pressure on the consumers starting into the end of the year. So more right. pressure means more layoffs. Do they right size across the traditional 3 to 4 percent, everybody out the door across all sectors, or do you see any given bank, including J.P. Morgan, being surgical and saying, we don't want to do this business? The surgical work has already been happening. It's actually been happening for years. If you think about it, last year we saw a lot of that work happen in the mortgage market, for example. This year you're starting to see dozens at a time being announced in terms of the layoffs you're seeing in investment banks this summer. But do we get much, much more than that? That classical 5% that you're talking about, there's no doubt that you see that. You see that every year. That was a pandemic kind of fluke almost that you saw that stop. And so this gives the banks more wiggle room right now to say, OK, business is down. We just don't need these many hats. How much are we expecting from the big banks to hear that they are having to increase the interest they pay on deposits, that that's seriously crimping their income in a way that they're not able to offset with higher income loans that are longer term? There's this pretty great monitor put out by Jeffries a couple of days ago. They call it their hot money report. And you see the massive differences that you're seeing between those big banks and those smaller banks to pay up for deposits. If you look at J.P. Morgan or Bank of America, you're still getting a basis point, maybe two basis points. You're getting not much at all from a typical savings account. Now, there are promotional offers elsewhere, but to the point you're making, we haven't seen that move for those big banks. There is an expectation that you're going to start to see that go higher. JP Morgan has guided that in prior quarters. When does that happen, I think, is what you're asking. And does it make a dent for JP Morgan? Because remember, last quarter was a record quarter of revenue. This quarter is supposed to be another record quarter of revenue. And so how much does that move really matter for their bottom line? Shinali, stay close. In the next hour, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, then on to City a little bit later this morning. Shinali's going to break those numbers down for you. Joining us now, Gerard Cassidy, the head of US Bank Equity Strategy over at RBC Capital Markets. Gerard, wonderful to get your perspective, as always, to kick off earnings season. Gerard, just how bad is this going to be? 
Actually, John, I, I, I don't expect it to be terrible. Um, when you take a look at the uh, current conditions for banks, when banks get into serious trouble, it's always regarding credit. And credit's going to be pretty good this quarter. Now, yes, I'm with you. Margin pressure is going to be there, no doubt about it. The banks have had to pay up for deposits, particularly the regional banks. But we have to remember, you know, the banking system is still very flush with deposits. The loan to deposit ratio, which is a common measure to measure the leverage, is still quite low, especially for our largest banks. So I think the numbers are not going to be that bad. And I think the bar is very low. And we expect uh, many of the big banks to have numbers that maybe come in line to better yeah. than expectation. Hey, George, we make a big deal about Apple Computer with a three trillion dollar market cap. You mentioned deposits. J.P. Morgan's had a really tough time of it, Gerard. Pre-pandemic, they had one point six trillion dollars in deposits, and it's really slid out to two point four trillion dollars in deposits on its way, modeled out by Bloomberg to something much larger. Explain to mortals how big these banks are in the unique bigness of J.P. Morgan. Tom, you're absolutely right. I mean, our banks, uh, in particular, you know, the top three or even four, if you include Citigroup, uh, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells, and Citigroup, are gigantic banks. And compared to, you know, the days when we had money-centered banks like Manufacturers Hanover Trust or Chase Manhattan, chemical bank, you know, you look at the size of those banks, and they were the big banks in the 80s. These these uh, banks today are, are multiple sizes of that. So you're right, when you put out trillions, you know, we used to throw around billions like it was nothing. Now, it's trillions, and these companies are very, very large. And in, in the case of J.P. Morgan and Bank America, extremely well managed. How do you do a run rate on J.P. Morgan out three years of the famed Gerard Cassidy seven-year terminal value. John, seven years out is when a lobster roll goes over $100 up in Portland. <laughs> and maybe it's already there. But Gerard, how do you model it out? Is it a mid-single-digit performer, high single-digit, or can, JB, can Jamie Dimon and his, his a follower, can they do a true double-digit performance? It's a great question because when you think about the size of our biggest banks, uh, banks, as we all know, are products of the economy. And our biggest banks grow at the nominal rate of GDP. So if you're thinking that the United States has real GDP growth of, let's call it 1%, 3% inflation, you're looking at mid-single-digit top-line growth. Now, they can enhance that uh, to the bottom line through some positive operating leverage, meaning revenue growth is faster than expense growth, and then, of course, share repurchases. But if you can consistently, as one of our biggest banks, run your bottom line earnings in the high single digit earnings growth without any real disruptions over the long period, Tom, that creates inc very strong value for shareholders. I like how you assume that Jamie Dimon won't be there in seven years, Tom. What? You know, who, who that's, knows? Called, that's called doing an Iger. Okay? Who knows? That's doing an Iger. You come back and you hang around to choose a successor. You leave and then you come I love, back. How long know? before we start calling Bob Iger just the successor? I asked Ed Ludlow that uh, yesterday. I, I, I mean, and Cassidy, Cassidy. Seriously, Gerard Cassidy is a guy who's lived banks without succession plans. Jared, work with me on this because you know this far better than anyone out there. Jared, when you start to raise interest rates at the Federal Reserve, typically what banks do is they try and pass that on to lenders before they try and pass that on to the deposit base. They're forced to do the latter. They want to do the former. How is that speed, that relationship between rates at the Fed and the pass-through to the deposit base and the pass-through to people borrowing, what does that look like now? You, John, you're putting your thumb right on the, the one of the biggest um, points that people are going to be focused on this quarter is the so-called deposit beta. And that's to your point, you know, how quickly and how much do the banks pass on to their depositors relative to what the Fed has done? And it's been rather slow, but it's going to accelerate this quarter. We're going to see these deposit betas. I believe the Fed raised Fed funds rates in the second quarter by 50 basis points. And we expect to see Many banks have deposit rates in excess of that. So the so-called deposit beta is over 100 percent. But that being said, we still have to remember it, these deposit betas are much lower than 2004 and 2006 when the loan to deposit ratios were much higher. And that's
that's a governor on how fast these deposit betas go. We should also remember, John, if we get to a terminal rate on Fed funds by September, I would suggest that by the end of the year, deposit rates will not be going any higher. They burn out after the, depo- uh, the terminal rate is reached. Have the higher rates at regional banks been working to attract deposits away from the biggest banks? And I say this after passing one of the regional banks with a sign, five and a half percent rates on six months T-bills, basically, uh, puts your money with us. You're getting, what, 0.1 percent, as Shanali just said, at J.P. Morgan. Is it working? Yes. What, what the banks do, they use the service surgical instrument certificates of deposit to attract these deposits for the high rates because they don't want to lift up their entire uh, deposit book to five and a half percent because not all depositors are demanding that. So as a result, the UCDs today coming into the first quarter, uh, we had to uh, CDs as a percentage of total funding in banks around 10 to 11 percent. Uh, I would think in the second quarter, that's obviously going to go higher. But, but when you compare it to the historical times in the 80s, we had CDs as a percentage of bank funding at 50 percent. Now, CDs, there's nothing wrong with CDs. They're just expensive. And you will see this quarter, many banks will have much bigger funding coming from CDs than they did in the first quarter. Just minutes away from the release, select the release of J.P. Morgan. This is expected to be the first read, Gerard, of what the acquisition of First Republic really looked like and what they're planning to do with those assets. What are you expecting to learn? How important is it to get this read? I, you know, for the First Republic, when you think about the size of it, it was a big bank, don't get us wrong, in terms of failure. But to Tom's point about how big J.P. Morgan Chase is, it will have a positive impact, no doubt about it. But I think there's going to be a much bigger focus, and you guys touched on it earlier, on the investment banking results. There'll be a bigger focus on the consumer bank, which is their biggest division, the consumer and community banking area, and also on the net interest margin, as well as credit. So don't get me wrong, First Republic will be looked at, but it's not the you know the big swing factor this quarter, in our opinion. Hey, Gerard, thank you. I know you're going to stay close and stick with us to break down these numbers when they drop. Gerard Cassidy there of RBC. JP Morgan just around the corner. Wells Fargo numbers as well. And then it's on to City a little bit later this morning, TK. We start to push through earnings season pretty quickly. And each bank different and all that. I, I got to admit, I'm moving beyond the banks already after what we saw with PepsiCo and revenue growth at Free to lay Seriously, we were making jokes about it, but folks, 14% revenue growth, 10% blended revenue growth at Pepsi. I'm fascinated how that carries over to the banks, Cassidy constructive, but then beyond as well. Loan losses and loan loss reserves. Big focus on credit coming into this quarter, and I think a bit of pushback there, Lisa, from Gerard on that specific point. This is going to be really key, not only what they see right now with loan losses going up and credit delinquencies, but what they're expecting going forward based on some of their surveys, based on credit card payments, based on some of the granular data, because this really may give the tea leaves that give a sense of whether Pepsi can continue uh, doing what they're doing. It's been quite a week, hasn't it? It's been crazy. The data, the earnings. (laughs) Yeah. I'm pleased the earnings have finally arrived. Because there was a moment there earlier this week when it got a bit snoozy. Was it Monday or Tuesday? Both. Just kind of like super sleepy, (laughs) both Monday and Tuesday. He was actually on Tuesday. Tuesday was wicked nudgy. And what's interesting, (laughs) uh, wicked nudgy, it's a Boston phrase. Uh, But what's interesting here, John, is even the people that saw the soft landing coming, I think, are benumbed by it on a Friday. Even the people that got it right are like, oh. Euro, 112. Wow. Encouraged by the economic data so far this week. Let's see if it can continue. JP Morgan results here in New York. We'll break that down for you up next. the bank failures put deposit costs and deposit growth in the spotlight. It feels like that is already priced into the stocks in terms of further pain. And I think the CPI print gives bank stocks some relief as we can see the light at the end of the proverbial tunnel in terms of Fed tightening. Erica Najarian there of UBS, first out the gate. Wells Fargo looks like at first look 
Bit of a beat here. Shanali Bassett breaking this one down. Hey, Shanali. A bit of a beat is good news for Wells Fargo. You have them coming in with revenue at about $20 billion, $20.5 billion above that $20 billion estimate. Now, why is this a good thing is because you are really worried about what the bottom line is going to look like. But as long as they're bringing in more at the top, it's a good thing. Interesting note here. There's an expectation this quarter that Wells Fargo is going to come in above Citigroup in terms of revenue that they're bringing into the table. You are still seeing pressure on the stock at first blush here, actually flipping a positive here, because you do have also, I believe, EPS also beating estimates. The charge-offs coming in at six seventy four uh, seven sixty four million, just above estimates, but nothing to cry home about. Now, remember, with Wells Fargo, we watch their consumer presence, particularly when it comes to the mortgage market. There's a question here about whether there'll be a greater delay here when we're thinking about those charge-offs when it comes to single-family homes, net interest income coming in above expectations. Let's work through JP Morgan as well. And that's just come out. Second quarter, EPS in at 475. Can break this down from division to division for you. Fixed sales and trading revenue in at $4.57 billion. The estimate $4.3 billion. Investment banking revenue in at $1.49 billion. US dollars, the estimate 1.38 billion. A bit of commentary from Jamie Dimon expecting probable changes to come for bank liquidity. Shanali's going to get her teeth into that in just a moment. There's another headline that jumps out for me as well, Shanali, as you work through the same release. The provision for credit losses for the second quarter, 2.9 billion, the estimate 2.62. What jumps out to you? I think that's a very, very important number here. You have managed net interest income coming in just above expectations. We knew JP Morgan was going to make money. But listen, those provisions, JP Morgan is the conservative bank on the street. So for that to come in above expectations will lead to more questions about how quickly these loans are converting into losses. JP Morgan has said time and time again that they want to lend, which comes with some losses. When you look at Wall Street's estimates, there's an expectation here that those provisions start to peak out in the coming quarter, this current quarter. But we'll listen for commentary on whether that is true or not, or whether there yeah. is more pain to come. Unfair to you on, on this, but I'm looking at, at J.P. Morgan's quarter has after-tax gain of nearly $2 billion on First Republic. And my recollection was they alluded to this. Yep. Are they bringing in this train wreck bank and making profit day one? Well, listen, there were some parts of First Republic, and I will also say you have J.P. Morgan clipping at the heels of Silicon Valley Bank as well to bring on new customers when it comes to the technology industry, to bring on uh, new people when it comes to people that could serve those high net worth individuals. So, yes, you say train wreck of a bank. It did fail. However, they got this deal for a song with guarantees. And so when you look at their uh, kind of day one lift from First Republic, that number is to be expected and nothing crazy. You also have him talking about probable changes for bank liquidity. I think that this is important because there's an expectation here that the future rules and regulations will start to impact the ROE you're getting from some of these uh, This banks. bank's really struggling, John. I think when we're in Davos this year talking to Mr. Diamond or Mr. Pinto, Ms. Ms. Erdos, I, I mean, we've really got to be careful here. Gerard Cassidy with us here. And Gerard, when you and I were having a, a Narragansett on St. Patrick's Day up in Boston a few years ago, we were not modeling 25% return on tangible common equity 20% return on common equity. Come on, Gerard. I've never seen those numbers. Is once again, Mr. Diamond and Mr. Pinto, are they going to have to hide how profitable this machine is? Tom, I'm glad you brought that up because though, yes, the um, provision was slightly higher uh, for uh, J.P. Morgan, the message is that these companies are very profitable, even with higher credit costs. And again, credit is critical on determining profitability through the cycle. And everybody's worried about credit. But as you guys just pointed out a moment ago, Ago, if we go into a soft landing, this profitability for the group is going to remain very strong. And Tom, it's going to be like back in 1995. The banks had a great year after 1994 when everybody thought we were going to go into a recession in 94. 
five, and it never happened. And this is lining up possibly to be very similar for J.P. Morgan and others. Which raises a question, Gerard, of what this says about the broader economic backdrop. We are, as we get results from J.P. Morgan, the shares up about 2 percent. Uh, Jamie Dimon saying the consumer balance sheets remain healthy, saying the economy continues to be resilient, saying that they saw material growth across all sectors, even though they did uh, miss slightly on equity sales and trading. From your vantage point, how clean of a read is this on broader economic growth and just the general path forward? It, 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 Lisa, it's very encouraging when you see numbers like this. To your point, it's broad based. And when you look at the health of the economy and the leverage in the economy, it, the U.S. banking industry has been deleveraged because of what happened in 08, 09. And the U.S. banks are in very strong shape handling what's going on today. And should this economy do a soft landing, and that's the critical piece, then the stocks will do well going over the next 12 months. But if we hit a hard landing, uh, it's going to be very difficult for the banks, including J.P. Morgan. But that doesn't appear to be the case, at least today. When you talk about credit losses, here's one tidbit. The J.P. Morgan second quarter provisions for credit losses are $2.9 billion versus $1.1 billion a year ago. You talked about the need to keep extending credit to get that interest, even at a time of slightly deteriorating credit. Is this a time of levering back up of the American consumer into perhaps a soft patch, but just not yet? It's going to be interesting because we all remember what happened during the pandemic and all the stimulus payments. Uh, consumers didn't need to borrow, and so they're borrowing now, and we're back at near record or at record levels, I should say, on consumer credit. But we got to remember, incomes have, have gone up over the last three or four years considerably, and they can handle this. You look at the debt service coverage of the consumer, and it's still well below the levels of 2006. And to your point on the provisions, we have in our model for J.P. Morgan this year, they're going to put up about $11.3 billion in provisions. And last year, they were 6.4. And to Tom's point, they're still putting up 20% return on equity. That's the point. They can handle the higher provisions because business at the rev on the revenue side are still quite strong. Let's get the pre-market price action on the screen. JP Morgan results out just months ago, together with Wells Fargo. A beat and a beat. JP Morgan up by about 3% in the pre-market right now. Let's just work through some of this together, Shanali. I want to bring you back in. Jamie Dimon is saying all the right things about various business lines. But then he mentions this about investment banking fees. They remain challenged. Is that going to be something that stands out for you for this quarter, not just from JP Morgan, but others as well? For the big consumer banks, it still comes down to what they're doing with the consumer here. You're seeing average loans up 13%. But on the investment banking front, remember, why do people like investment banking? All you're really paying is your banker. They took some money off their uh, corporate uh, corporate book here. You see some losses being taken there. So I do wonder about underwriting when it comes to the leverage loan markets, when it comes to other corporate underwriting standards as well as the consumer. Because if you take a look, what's interesting is some of these provisions, they're actually because of First Republic as well. So I think the market can let that go a little bit. They're bringing on a new book here. Uh, to the point that Gerard and everyone has been making all morning, not just 20% return on equity, 25% return on tangible common equity. I mean, these are blow out yeah. profits for JP Morgan, regardless of that softness in investment banking. But with that said, to Tom's point, they are one of the banks that have been laying people off by the dozen. You buried in a PowerPoint, and I really want to congratulate all the PR people at, at JP Morgan. There's some real clarity to it. Uh, John, you take dividends, you take share buybacks of almost Thank $2 you. billion. Thank 33%, 33% uh, payout. They have so much wiggle room to give out more money. They're like Apple. They got so much yeah. air to, to go beyond given any stresses. I believe that is a beat and a race. The estimate for net interest income at about 87 billion US dollars. It had been previously 84 billion. So, Shanali, can we call that this morning a beat and a race from JP Morgan? We can. You know what's interesting about it, too? Even in the investment bank, they're not losing money everywhere. Fixed income, if you take a look at it, for example, the higher revenue was in the securitized products group. That sounds kind of boring, but it is one of the hottest businesses on Wall Street. JP Morgan has guided us to look at it. So, even if they have competition left, right, and center from private markets or whatever, that, that group is doing quite well. 
well, which means that things are being offloaded into the market. And you could potentially continue to see that. That is capital markets coming back. Tonight, stick around. That's Wells Fargo and JP Morgan behind us in front of us still this morning. City, then on to next week, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley at Goldman Sachs. Just about 10 minutes away, we'll catch up with Ken Leon of CFRA. Anastasia Ramoroso of iCapital coming up shortly as well. Off the back of those results, JP Morgan positive in the pre-market. S&P 500 futures just about turning positive as well. On the S&P up by 0.05% after gains on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Let's see if we can make some gains in this equity market this Friday. Inflation should be going down. The economy is slowing. Not expecting a massive pickup in inflation, but I think it's way too early to be calling victory laps. We will and should still expect to see over the next several quarters a continued slowdown. This is what the Fed wants. We hope they only hike one more time. They probably shouldn't do that. They could declare mission accomplished, except that's a jinx. So it's better that they don't do that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Bank earnings coming through from J.P. Morgan. Wells Fargo at City up next. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitt, Tom Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures just turning positive in the last 20 minutes or so on the S&P 500. J.P. Morgan up in the pre-market. It's a beat and a raise, Tom, from Jamie Diamond and the team. Beat and a raise, and it really shows the quality here. I, I want to be clear. Every bank's uh, a different story with Citigroup coming later. It's going to be a completely different uh, take. What I find interesting here, and this goes back to our conversation with Senator Warren a few days ago, in the defense of anyone, of any party, we need to learn the ginormousness of these banks. They hide it every day. I happen to be looking, John, at the uh, paragraphs here in bullet points on asset and wealth management with some footnotes here about weakness um, um, uh, weakness in the quarter uh, because of travel. But other than that, we've got expenses up 8%, but revenues up 11%. Three trillion up two percent on uh, assets under management. I mean, th- even asset management is phenomenal. Let's get to what Jamie Dimon had to say just moments ago. Almost all lines of our business saw continued growth. That's the happy talk. Let's park the happy talk for just a second. Yes, Lisa. Outside of all of that, and we have to give it a mention. Provisions for credit losses just creep in a little bit higher. You had your eye on that. I did too. Others have as well coming into this quarter. There's still a focus. This is an expected result of what we are seeing and we're expecting to see of consumers spending perhaps a little bit less. We did hear that from Jamie Dimon saying consumers are spending, albeit a little more slowly. How much does that really speak to what's to come down the line at a time where they're increasing their net interest income well more than anyone expected? So they're still lending because they're earning so much. And just to give you some numbers around that, Wells Fargo reported 13 point two billion dollars in net interest income for the quarter. That's up 29 percent from a year ago. Right. And just like J.P. Morgan, it was a beat and a raise, saying that it was probably going to rise 14 percent for the full year. Just very quickly here on a conference call, maybe you don't ask this, but on the research call, I want to know what commercial real estate does to these various banks. That's what I don't see in the PowerPoints. We'll hear more about that a little bit later. Yeah most likely from the analysts on Wall Street who we'll catch up with. We'll speak to Ken Leon in just a moment. Look out for that. In around about 48, 58 minutes from now, we might hear from City 2. Lisa's going to give you the guide for what to look for this morning in just a moment. What to look for in the market. JP Morgan up in the pre-market. City, Wells Fargo running as well. Early days, let's see if that sticks. But equity futures turn positive on the S&P. Four-day winning streak on the S&P 500 into Friday. Let's see if we can make that day five. Equity futures positive by close to 0.1%. Yields have been down, down, down all week. They're up this morning by a couple of basis points on a 10-year to just short of 380. And in the FX market, the euro's been strong, strong, strong all week, except this morning. That rally takes a pause, Lisa. Euro dollar, slightly negative. The rally in bank shares not taking a pause as we get the early results out of the big banks. JP Morgan and Wells Fargo both reported about uh, 15, 20 minutes ago. We are expecting Citigroup around 8 a.m. The analyst calls. This will be key to really understand the granularity behind some of the loan loss provisions and what they're 
they're expecting with respect to the economy. 8.30 a.m. for J.P. Morgan, 10 a.m. for Wells Fargo, and 11 a.m. for Citigroup. At 10 a.m., we get the latest economic data read, uh, University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey. It is expected to increase. Again, this speaks to the soft landing narrative that has gotten everybody worked into a frenzy of the everything rally of this week. And today, the NASDAQ is oh, grappling today. with Very how cool. to understand the dominance of the six biggest tech players. They are going to readjust. They are announcing the details around this new rebalancing to bring down the total concentration of those big stocks to below 50 percent so that they don't breach regulatory hurdles for a lot of the uh, funds that are tracking uh, these indexes. For, for all of you distracted by this, this, I'm really glad you bring this up. This is a huge deal to the equity market. This is not just another thing. And people, and I'll read every single word I can on this. This is, it's not like a joke about the Dow and the S&P 500. This is, a, it's like, I feel like it's almost nifty 50. Johnson & Johnson, a million years ago, our world has changed. How do we mathematically adjust to it? It's not a small matter. A lot going on this morning, but our lead story, JP Morgan in the pre-market up by 2.8%. Ken Leon, the director of equity research at CFRA, joins us now for more. Ken, should I be focused on the beat, the raise, or the provisions for credit losses? I think focus on the economy and the strength of, of the results and performance. And what this means is, you know, banks are kind of peculiar. You build reserves mostly for loan losses uh, and also looking ahead to perhaps uh, weaker performance. Sometimes you have loan loss re reversals. We had that a year ago. So what's likely now is if we have a soft landing, not a recession, in the second half of this year, the likelihood is these provisions begin to slow down and possibly the reserves may be too high in 2024 when you have an ability to beat much better comparisons to 23. This was a good quarter. We thought this would be the trough of the investment banking cycle, and we are seeing green shoots, but the strength of the consumer and commercial loan activity is yeah. very promising, and size matters here, and that's been your discussion in the last half hour. Ken Leon, that's right where I wanted to go on size that matter. I'm gonna give you two, buried in a PowerPoint, Ken Leon, and I know you know this, and probably knew it already, 35% pre-tax margin on J.P. Morgan Asset and Wealth Management. 35% on the dollar. Folks, that's that's almost like, it's not in the textbooks is how I'd uh, put that. And what's so important to me, Ken, the return on equity within Marriott's system leaps from a 25 blend system up to 34% ROE. Have you ever seen a big profit machine like that in asset? in wealth management? You know, it's amazing, Thomas. J.P. Morgan has done this, you know, with less fanfare than others, such as James Gorman and Morgan Stanley. That took it from 12 to 25% and probably 30. These are, these are phenomenal numbers, and it speaks to making the right strategic decision to expand an asset and wealth management. That's what Goldman Sachs, unfortunately, will have to talk about next week, where they made the wrong turn, and they're trying to play catch yeah. up in these amazing areas. It's, Lisa, that's exactly where I wanted to go. This is not about, I've never seen this before from J.P. Morgan and the, what the improvement was at Gorman uh, coming on ages ago. This is about the ones that aren't doing it. And we're going to look to that next week in particular. Ken, I'm curious your take on the net interest uh, income coming in so strong, upgrading that for the full year at a time when a lot of people are critical of the big banks for not passing along those extra profits to depositors more quickly, akin to what we're seeing over the, in the regionals. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, we have a beautiful chart somewhere, but basically it's two points. You have one lever, which is rates, and rates might have peaked. But if you have increased loan activity, that will spur uh, net interest margins and maybe keep the earnings asset yields uh, at decent spreads, even though we have this disintermediation where depositors are looking for 5% or so. This is, this is really promising uh, for the larger banks. It's about 50, 55% of total net revenue. As to your point, Lisa, you get a little bit more downstream it's 65 percent or more. So that might help the, the smaller banks. And, and we're going to be watching that at CFRA. 
What are we seeing, Ken, with respect to depositors getting sick of earning nothing on what they are parking at these banks and moving and actually shifting into CDs, into income-producing instruments? Is this causing any kind of pressure, or have we seen a surprising stickiness of these deposits that will allow this type of net interest income to continue? Yeah, so that continues. That's far the biggest macro trend is this pivot uh, to getting higher yield. Uh, and additionally, uh, there is, of course, uh, non-interest bearing deposits and deposits that are there because you, you're a small business doing business like with Bank of America and you have relationships. So, um, you know, I think that will continue. But if we reach next week where we've reached the Fed finishing its rate rise regime and pause and then perhaps cut next year, um, this will be less of a factor. Ken, can we just finish on regulatory overhang? Bit of pushback, I think, then in the statement this morning from JP Morgan. I just wonder how much of an overhang that's going to be on the whole group of stocks in the banking sector. 100%. And that's where I would have started this conversation was Michael Barr's holistic capital approach that we studied rigorously that talks about the interplay of liquidity and capital risk and taking $2 for every $100 for risk weighted assets. But, you know, capital will increase. Uh, if I'm a, a, an investor, I'm looking at total return, this might put some kind of ceiling on buybacks that none of the banks did. Uh, those in the Dodd-Frank stress test were allowed to do, but they had dividend increase. Capital and return of capital is what Jamie Dimon's most worried about because a sophisticated investor may say, I may go elsewhere. Ken, thank you, sir. Ken Leon. Of CFRA, we'll check back in again with you a little bit later in the next hour. We've heard from Wells Fargo, from JP Morgan. A little bit later this morning, 50 minutes away, we'll hear from City. If we can check out the price action of those three names right now, all three of them positive in the pre market. JP Morgan, Wells, and City up, 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 and away. We're positive on equity futures as well on the SP 500 by 0.1%. JP Morgan up by 2.5%. Tom, Wells up by 27 City up by close to 2%. I wonder how the sell side adjusts here in the last couple of days off, say, Amazon Prime. I've seen some tweaks. We're up $20, price target, whatever. Tweak, tweak, tweak. Do we get tweaks here or do we get a reaffirmation of a one year view, two year view? It's really not priced into the market by institutional Wall Street. Prime Day, best sales day ever over at Amazon. Did you see that headline? I, I've read some of it. Yeah. Um, Citigroup uh, had a uh, – Ron Josie had a really smart note out uh, on this, and he really tore it apart. What, what I don't understand, because I'm really not playing the game, is it benefits all. Prime Day is not just about Amazon. It's about everybody else competing, reacting in that, and go over to Target or wherever – and it's an online day, almost more than a prime day. This has been a theme. We've heard this from the early earnings pretty much across the board. The consumer is still strong. The economy doesn't seem to be losing steam that fast. Perhaps they're spending a little bit less, but not necessarily, especially with Amazon Prime. So now this goes for the banks into the question of regulatory overhang. When do they potentially fight back? Is that priced in? And then how do we get a recession if we have this type of, of situation, just let me finish, where you have consumers still strong? See, that's like in the kitchen. Um, Lisa, my point is we're worried about regulatory overhang. I've never seen those numbers in J.P. Morgan as a blended idea, asset management. Everyone in the world has to react to that. My answer is everyone worldwide, Latin America, Asia, they're going, hmm, I'm scared. Where are they throwing money? J.P. Morgan, and they'll pay whatever it takes. You finish fighting. It's, no, it's a, it's a, it, we're not fighting. It's, you know. It's, it's a disagreement. It's a, no, no. You're just disappointed it's, with each other. It's, we're, yes. You're not angry. <laughs> I feel Diamond. vulnerable. We I'll don't to, do passive I'll get to the headline from right. J.P. Morgan. No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. We caution the impact of material regulatory changes. That's the little bit of pushback this morning. JP Morgan up in the pre-market. Equity futures right now positive too. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Equities up by 0.08%. It's been quite a week for the equity market, quite a week for the bond market too. Coming up very shortly, Megan Swiber of Bank of America Securities on interest rates. We'll catch up with her in about 20 minutes time. The guide, the playbook through the rest of this morning. You've heard from Wells, you've heard from JP. You're going to hear from Citi. And Jane Fraser, Tom, in about 47 minutes. A totally different bank. They want to give you an international spin. It's going to be fascinating to see what she's pulling back on. As I mentioned to Shanali Basak, 
I don't think this is a normal right-sizing season. July now feels like it should be October, and there's going to be a lot of tough decisions made. I'm really interested what the tough decisions are at a, a city group that's been basically challenged for a decade. What's left to pull back on over a city? That's true. Where are we in terms of cutting to the bone? It's, it's a cliche, but it's also, I think, John, it's a very valid observation. Shanali's going to drop by in the next hour too. Looking forward to that. Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital coming up shortly. Called this equity market rally a number of months ago and that rally this week, Tom, has continued. And does she stay with it? You know, that's, yeah. That's the heart of the matter. Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital coming up next. was very clear that inflation was and still is at levels that are too high for their comfort. The lag effects of Fed hikes will eventually begin to slow things down. We're already seeing that across all indicators. We are nowhere near the 2% target where they want it to be. And with that backdrop, of course, they will continue to say, we just got to keep going. And that's exactly what they're saying. Torsten Slock, Apollo Global Management Chief Economist, weighing in on the long and variable lags of the Federal Reserve, the rate hiking cycle of the last year plus, and the tightening that's going to bite into this economy in the months ahead of us. Equity futures right now positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. There's a lift in this equity market, a lift in the pre-market as well. JP Morgan, City, Wells Fargo positive after results from JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, and from Wells Fargo as well. JP Morgan in the pre-market, a lift here, Lisa, up by 2.4%. Wells up by 3 A lot of this is the net interest income, which is coming in, uh, in more uh, bigger than expected, as well as an upgrade in terms of at longer term expectations. Again, big banks are getting their capital for free and they're lending it out at the highest interest rates going back decades. This is the underpinning for record revenues, which we have seen quarter after quarter. And it's a regime shift for a huge body of the Bloomberg surveillance audience. They've never seen somewhat normative rates, John, a legitimate real rate, a sharp ratio you can actually calculate. And to borrow from Torsten Slack, what are the long and variable lags of J.P. Morgan, the long and variable lags of James Diamond? And to me, it's use of cash where they're delivering 33% to dividend, dividend growth, and to share buyback. And that's teens weeds for a scale of that size. They've got room to move to deliver cash to shareholders. Early days, but decent start to earnings season. In yes. the last 24 yeah, hours, yeah, PepsiCo, fair. Delta, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, City still to come. We're trying to get perspective here, and we've heard a lot from bears vacillating, readjusting up. Anastasia Amoroso, chief investment strategist at iCapital, she doesn't have to uh, vamp it up at all. She nailed it, the market up. Let's go back in history. What did you see in October? What did you see that was enthusiasm for the market? Back in October, what we saw were valuations that were discounting a lot. I mean, if you looked across the equity markets, you had the S&P that was trading, I think, at the time in the 40th percentile over the last 15 years. If you look at investment grade and high yield bonds that were trading, you know, in the nines or 10th percentile of their respective ranges. So we were discounting a lot and then positioning. I mean, Tom, could you get anybody to invest in any risk asset in October of last year? The answer is no. And then ultimately, the catalyst, you always need a catalyst. Is, what we saw was that by the middle of this year, there was likely to be this gap that was going to open up between where the level of Fed funds rate is and where inflation was going to be. And that gap was going to be positive, meaning Fed funds rate is above the rate of core inflation. And that's sort of what we are today. And I think that's what's been happening in the last six months. We've incrementally be getting, been getting closer and closer to that pivot point. But as you know, markets price that in, in advance. So what next? I guess the question, you know, you've wrote this equity market bull market if you want to call it that year today. What are you doing now? I mean, you stick with it. You stick with it. And, you know, for now, I think we are on track for a soft landing. And I know, you know, the bearish camp would say, well, you look at positioning and it's getting very exuberant, you know, by some metrics. You look at, you know, whether it's hedge funds, whether it's CTAs, all of those investors have, you know, very quickly, very bullishly positioned. So, you know, that leaves you susceptible to a negative catalyst. But can you name a negative catalyst right now? You know, we've got, if we've got inflation that is easing, we've got the Fed that is pausing and, you know, 
you know, Lisa, you talk about this all the time. If you've got the consumer that is strong and is not going anywhere, you know, then where's this equity market going to go? You know, so for now, I think when I square the valuations, which is supported around these levels, and when I square that with 2024 earnings, which, by the way, have been de-risked a lot, that gives you close to 4800 on the S&P. And just to let you know, I could give you a n numerous uh, catastrophic situations that could <laughs> potentially happen to curtail it, but that doesn't look likely. And that is the underscored uh, point here that we are seeing less headwinds to this rally continuing, which raises a question of leadership. How much do you shift away from what's done best so far to some of the small cap areas, the financials, after seeing the results that we've seen uh, just this morning? Yeah. Well, I think you stick with tech because tech, of course, is where the growth is and is going to continue to be. And I am a big fan of artificial intelligence. I think that's a huge trend that is adding to earnings of companies starting today. So you stick with tech. But at the same time, Lisa, um, I'm really coming around on financials. And, you know, if you look at the earnings results this morning, there's not much to be disappointed about. You know, yes, we know deposit betas are going to rise, but guess what? That's priced in. You know, yes, we know lending is going to be slower, but that's also baked into the cake. And what I'm actually encouraged about for financials are two things that I don't think are yet priced in. The first one is the possibility of a steeper yield curve. If we are, in fact, in a soft landing scenario, that at some point the Fed is going to pause and maybe even ease if inflation really comes down, and if the economy is still on track, then the back part of the curve should actually hold up. The only thing that someone could say if they were bearish, and Tom would grunt, and he would say, oh, come on, I, I can't stand this, the concept of regulatory overhang. Yeah. If perhaps these banks do too well, and suddenly the supervisors and Congress members decry that and try to put more constraints on them. Is that something you're watching? Yeah, it does need to be baked into the models for sure. But I would say it's a one-time risk. That's a one-time adjustment that would be that would have to be made. And guess what? It's also being talked about mm -hmm. in the research reports. But the other thing, again, that I don't think is yet baked in, you know, possibility of steeper yield curve, but also the possibility of deal activity picking up. I know that in some of the results that we're seeing today, you know, there's not much to write home about when it comes to IPO volumes or M&A. But I think conditions are starting to be in place for capital markets to really open up in the back half of the year. So that means more IPO volumes, more announced M&A deals, which, by the way, picked up this quarter, more of them getting done. And that's positive for banks. It's positive for alternative asset managers, for all the PE companies, private equity companies that will have the exit opportunities they haven't had. Let's get concise. Do you see a second leg of, the bull, of a bull market to a fossil like me that's early 1976? And what's an SPX call? Don't give me this 90-day garbage that you do. Give me like a one-year, two-year, three-year view. I want, I'm scared stiff. I've missed this. I need to participate. Do I have a luxury of a second leg of a bull market? I'll give you a six-month view of oh, that. But she's okay. really reaching out, John. Six months. <laughs> you know, it's somewhere between it's the great. 90-day and the one-year. But the, the, the six-month view, I think we do push higher towards 4,800 uh, on, on the S&P. And I'm a little bit more cautious going to 2024 because, you know, if we are at a point where the real rates do become restrictive, you know, at some point we may actually have a downturn in the economy. So I don't want to pre-trade that. So that's why I'm sticking with it. But at some point in 2024, we might have to have a different conversation. It's been a great call so far this year. Congratulations, Thank Anastasia you. Ramoroso of iCapital. Been bullish on this equity market. Been right to be bullish. TK looking for record highs later this month, in the month of July. Yeah, to frame her critical comment on real yields, and I did a study of where was the 10-year real yield pre-2008, and the answer is 2.03, 2.05%. A lot of fancy math. Most experts I'm talking to, John, say we're not going to get back there. The real yield this morning has come lower the last couple of days in this celebration, 1.53%. And I'd say there's a center tendency of 1.5 to 1.7 is sort of a healthy real yield. And, you know, you just you wonder with the dynamics of the system how that will play out. Do you get the real yield that Anastasia's talking about that impinges a bull market? Anastasia mentioned the banks coming around to the financials. Laurie Cavasina, we'll catch up with her a little bit later. Laurie upgrading the banks overnight, a lift to her earnings forecast. But Lisa, going to overweight financials and after the results this morning, perhaps encouraged by that. Absolutely, especially at a time where they're gaining so much income from the consumer lending portion of their books, as well as the potentials Anastasia was talking about for deal making to pick back up. Wells Fargo saying that its average deposit cost soared 
to 1.1 percent, up from a measly 0.04 percent compared to the, say, 5, 5.5 percent being offered at some of the regional banks. So, yes, they're passing it along, but not nearly at the pace seen in some other it's firms. It's pathetic, isn't it's it? It's pathetic. It, it <laughs> yes, really exactly. Is pathetic. As TK, a depositor. 1 percent on deposits. I guess they can get away with what they can get away with. Okay, this goes right to asset they management. Get away with it. Exactly. There are people, John, in airplanes traveling worldwide, and people are throwing money at J.P. Morgan just for the name. I mean, it's that easy. They don't have to work. All they got to do is show up, and people go, J.P. Morgan, and I'll give you 0.2% interest. Yay. Equities, <laughs> slightly positive. This is Bloomberg. City's Andrew Honnhorst making a move on rates just published moments ago. Looking for a hike in July. They were looking for a hike in September, no longer. We now expect a skip in September with the subsequent and possibly last of this cycle hike delivered in November. On the soft inflation patch, the soft spot might last for several months and possibly the remainder of the year, but oh, still tight labour markets and a rebounding housing market risk a re-acceleration in inflation late this year or early next year. That's the latest from Holland Horse. So that's a shift off the back of the information we've learned, Tom, this week. I remember sitting with Steve Roach, I'll say 20 years ago, John, over the invention of this phrase, soft patch. And Roach just going, what have we become? What is a soft patch? A soft patch means a temporary <laughs> I, reduction in inflation look, pressures, Horst Tom, which could re-accelerate. And, and to a point, Holland Horse has done better on this than James Ballard. On the hike of cycle, without a day. He's been better Holland than the Fed. has just killed it. <laughs> and for him to go to a hawkish pause or dovish pause or that, we got to get somebody to write a paragraph where they get V-shaped, soft sure. patch, and a hawkish pause. Well, let's all establish the, the two paragraph. camps right now. Let's be careful about this. There are two camps at the moment. There is one camp who think this is it. We're on that sustainable trend on our way back to 2% without any damage done to the labor market. There are others who think that what is happening in the labor market right now is inconsistent with a sustainable path back towards 2%. And they believe you might get that soft patch through summer and potentially reaccelerate later this year. Lisa, there are two camps right now. And it's just sort of accelerated the debate when you hear the likes of Jamie Dimon saying that the consumer is still spending and that there's still a very, lot of strength in the economy. Can you have strength in the economy and ongoing disinflation once the comps get a little bit less easy to, 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 to sort of uh, hurdle, right? This is the question heading into next year. That's the debate for bonds for equities and FX as well, I guess. In equities right now on the S&P 500, futures shaping up as follows. Lisa's going to bring you the bank earnings in just a moment, but that provided a bit of a lift to the S&P 500 in the last 60 minutes or so. The S&P turning positive by 0.1%. JP, Wells behind a city still to come. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, what a move on a week on a two-year yield, down by almost 30 basis points so far this week, up by not even a basis point now on a two-year to 4.63. And with that move in the bond market, the dollar a whole lot weaker. Push it through foreign exchange. The euro now positive for a seventh consecutive session against the dollar. The euro slightly positive, Lisa, to 112.33. We haven't focused very much on the banks. J.P. Morgan, the first uh, of the ones we're going to look at, although Wells Fargo came out first. Again, across the board, beats. And the beats are notable for the magnitude. J.P. Morgan reporting a record revenue in the second quarter, reporting $41.3 billion. That is just in one quarter, beating expectations. They also lifted guidance for the net interest income. Those shares up 3%. Wells Fargo also lifting expectations for net interest income, given the fact that they're paying, what, 1% to their depositors, a whole 1% from nothing uh, a year earlier, basically saying that they expect their income to jump 14% for the full year. Previously, they had said 10%. Citigroup coming out uh, in just about a half an hour here. Those shares up about 2%. A lot more questions around Citigroup and some of the reorganization. But if you look at year to date, and when we talk to investors about where they see the opportunities, here's why. J.P. Morgan shares up 11%. When you compare that to NVIDIA's 4,000% or whatever you're going to call it, uh, gain you start to say, why are they underperforming if they're continuing to deliver these types of results? Wells Fargo up almost 6 percent and Citigroup up 5.4 percent. Do you start to see more investors rotate into financials because of just the sheer revenue from the interest increases that we've seen from the Fed that they don't have to pass along to depositors? Because evidently, depositors don't 
need to get paid you to stay. You feel very passionate about that, don't you? Well, I, I think that's one of the key questions because this sure. gap is just clearly taking money from depositors that are I, not I, getting anything It's one of those business on their lines. Savings. Any other business would be like, yeah, you know, they've got to make money. But when it comes to banks, we're like, well, it's pass personal. it on. Well, pass if you it think on. about it, you're it's getting nothing. It's personal for with money in the bank. Exactly. And so you think about these ballooning deposit accounts. You're giving them free money to work with and they're making I, a bank with it. Well, like, very quickly, Literally. one of the first things I heard, John, ever was from a banker of a small, tiny bank. And I said, why haven't you merged with somebody? And it was the smartest thing I ever heard. He said, Tom, we like to go to lunch. And it's such a, you know, at the small bank level, you know, they're just trying to keep at it so they can go to the rotary meeting, the lunch, whatever. Why are the super regionals any different? If I'm one of the 15 banks underneath these guys and I'm looking at J.P. Morgan's earnings today, why aren't the super regionals merging? I don't get well, it. Well, some of those banks were out for lunch, weren't they, in the last year or so? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, quite but, literally. You know, I just, but I'm I, Thank you. I'm, <laughs> you know, Sonali Basics says it nicely in a note, many wins for J.P. Morgan. There's also many wins for getting the bond market right. Megan Swiber joins us right now, Director of U.S. Rates Strategy at Bank of America. This is a brutal job. Does Moynihan call you up to get a briefing? <laughs> Pharaoh's big on this. Like, Brian's, like, wicked, wicked informed from his research staff. He harasses Ethan Harris at home on a weekend. Does he call you up to say, what's a terminal rate? You know, occasionally here and there. Um, but, you know, I would say that that's just been really the focus of markets m more broadly, right, is ultimately what it's going to come down to is what is the Fed going to do at the next meeting? Where does neutral sit? And that's been very important for the bond market. But, of course, as we were just talking about, the equity market and, and OK, but you did your Fabozzi and there's got to be a mathematics <laughs> that you go out to a place. We're back to a normal environment for fossils like me that we haven't seen in 16 years. What's the new, you know? In, in terms of terminal uncertainty, what's the new terminal rate you're working with? So, Tom, what it comes down to right now is the inflation picture. And part of the reason why we've been able to see rates rally so much this week is at the end of the day, we got a pretty promising CPI report. Um, and when you're looking at inflation being able to moderate, you know, when we when we dive into the details. What's that do to the terminal rate? What it what it does to the terminal rate is it reduces how much more we think the Fed will have to go. Um, if we listen to the more of the hawks on the committee, them needing them suggesting that there's still more room for the Fed to hike. What it comes down to is whether or not inflation is persistent or not. This core services ex housing component that Powell's really anchored the market on printed at zero percent month over month in the most recent reading. So it takes a little bit of the wind out of out of the sails of, of the more hawkish camp here. One thing I can get hawks and doves to agree on right now is this soft summer patch. For inflation. Yes, exactly. Then exactly, there's this yeah. divide that starts to emerge later exactly. this year, as you know, yep. Megan, yep. about the potential to re-accelerate. Exactly. Where are you and the team on that? So we are of the view that in the long run, inflation will be able to settle back to 2%. And I think that that's right. There is really this divergence between are we going to settle now closer to 3% by the end of the year, or is that going to be closer to 2.5%? What I'll say right now is that we're a little bit more so in the um, stickier inflation near-term camp. When I look at what the market's pricing, though, you look at one-year inflation swaps sitting below 2.2 percent this morning. Uh, even with our house view for a mild recession starting in the first half of next year, that's still about 40 basis points or so below where we're expecting. So I will say that the market seems to be very overly optimistic around where inflation is going to settle, even over the, the near term. And I think what it will come down to about this question of how quickly they're going to be able to see inflation moderate down to the target, it's going to be a matter of, of how strong the U.S. economy will, will continue to be. Um, and a lot of that economic resilience does skew the risks, I think, near term towards, towards more persistent prints. Then do you think that it's too early to get bullish on longer term bonds at a time when perhaps the market is overpricing the idea of this soft landing that yields low inflation, robust growth, and everything can chug along. So I think, Lisa, what this presents for us right now 
um, is the is when we look at what the market's pricing across the curve, I think it's too early to get bullish on the front end of the curve. And as, as was just highlighted, right, we've seen really that very notable rally in the two-year rate. I think what makes more sense right now from the investor perspective is going long further out the curve, actually closer to the 10-year point. And that's because when we look at prior hiking cycles, right, when you look at how the market performs 12 months after the Fed delivers that final hike, you usually see tens rally on average about 100 basis points over that 12-month period. The ability for the front end to really come down is going to be a question more so about when does the Fed deliver deliver these cuts. You talk about basically a real deepening in the yield curve inversion, and this would be a re-steeping or re-inversion mm -hmm. uh, down to near record lows or at least post-1981. What does that mean in terms of some of the dynamics that we're talking about this morning with banks and whether that increases the risk of this shallow uh, recession becoming something a little bit more? Yeah. So deeper inversion will put more pressure on banks for sure. Um, but what I think the curve inversion is really telling us right now, it's not so much so reflecting recession concerns, as some of these recession probability models will tell us. What it's reflecting is expectations for the Fed to cut. And the Fed cutting alongside inflation that's able to moderate back down to its target makes sense. The Fed thinks about setting interest rates through the real rate. So a 5% Fed funds rate is different when inflation's running at 4% than it is when inflation's running at 3%. So what we see the market pricing, and, and part of the real reason behind that yield curve inversion is this strong confidence in the market that the Fed's going to be able to get this back down to 2%. It's always been there. It's, amazing. it's you know, always, really, yes. It's beautifully spoken because, John, that's the absolute underlying belief structure that we have. It hasn't Fed, been shattered. It hasn't Fed, been shattered. You look at five-year, five-year break-evens, they've been pretty consistently priced at the Fed's target throughout this whole inflationary episode. That's the credibility test for Chairman Powell. In fact, he's basically said oh, that yeah. a few times. Oh, yeah. Can we finish on the global backdrop? We haven't discussed that much. Does it matter to your call that China's experiencing what some people might refer to as deflation, disinflation. The UK has got problems yep. with inflation, mm -hmm. Europe inflation. There's all this tension abroad in some major trading partners. How important is that? So I think it's definitely important, John. And when we think about the China story, right, what that will probably weigh more so in when we're thinking about what our inflation forecasts are to the, to the commodity story, right? And we've been able to see, and that's a major reason why year over year inflation has been able to fall so much, because commodity prices have fallen from where we were sitting this time last year. So the fact that we're seeing more of this weaker China story um, really does, I think, endorse the fact that the market's been able to price inflation down so much. When you're talking about how the market prices inflation, it's very, very highly correlated to the commodity story. So that in and of itself really does help uh, support lower inflation compensation priced across the curve. Megan, thank you. Big fan of your work together with Mark Cabana. Just brilliant. Oh, thank so you. Much. Thank Appreciate you very that. much. Thank, thank you. you. Megan Swiber there of Bank of America on rate strategy and this inflation backdrop. Some encouraging numbers so far this week. Big debate is whether that continues beyond the summer. Megan thinks it might be able to. Others do too. Then you've got Andrew Hollenhorst pushing back. Still looking for a hike beyond July and looking for another one, potentially, Lisa, in November. There's a tension if you have Jamie Dimon coming out and saying the consumer is still strong, they're still spending, the economy is still going forward, people are making a lot of money based on uh, higher interest, to then saying that the disinflation will just continue and the year-over-year -year comps will still allow that to happen. And that is the tension. JP Morgan up 3% in the pre-market. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program, the S&P 500 with a lift as well. We're positive here by 0.08%. Outside of that, take a look at the FX market. Just about positive on the euro against the dollar. Euro dollar 112.27. Seven consecutive days of this. If we close here, positive on the session on that currency pair, Tom. Longest streak since July 2020. That long. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. The persistency of the streaks are big deals. I alluded earlier to the great Stephen Englander, uh, John, and I think it's going to be a constant theme is to move from currency pair analysis to index analysis to trade weighted analysis. A full disclosure on a Friday, folks, I haven't done the work. But the answer is if you look at five, six, seven major IMF trade weighted series, I think you're going to get a real story there about the tensions as we enjoy a Trumpian weak dollar, the former president screaming we needed a weak dollar. But what's the impact on strong euro, strong sing dollar, yeah. strong yen? 112 isn't it yet. 
Let's be clear about I that. I would guess on, that. On the euro, it's not parity. I know that and everything's yeah. relative, but 112, <clears> I think we're still just about OK. Yeah. City earnings coming up in around about 17 minutes. So this is what we'll do. We'll break the numbers for you. Then we're going to get some reaction from Ken Leon of CFRA on those City results very shortly. Yeah. Shnali Bassett's going to drop by as well, Tom, and go through those numbers too. What are you going to read in on this weekend? Credit quality. I'm looking at da- David Ricardo. I, I got a week till Budapest, till Hungary. And I, to see Ricardo oh, you're going, driving, you're going. I, I'm going to read in on okay. that. Okay, David. What's it called? Tasso Rosso? <laughs> David? D- d- yeah. You know. Okay. He was a great uh, economist. He was named uh, after the economist. You think he drives an Alfa Tauri now? Whatever he drives. He's, <laughs> he's got some new car. He was, Ricardo was named after David Ricardo, the I, Scottish economist. No one knew. Yes, I don't think Daniel that? knew either. Equities, positive. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> There's clearly been a, a tremendous demand for uh, for bonds. Um, I think a lot of it is uh, there's a tremendous amount of liquidity out there still. I think the bonds are okay, and uh, I think stocks uh, st- still have upside, especially in the laggards like financials and industrials. Ed Yardani, bullish, still bullish of Yardani Research, the president there, weighing in on this equity market. Futures at the moment slightly positive on the S&P 500 by 0.1%. The numbers out of the bank's pretty decent this morning. Let's check them out. JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, City coming up next. JP beating a raise. Wells, it's basically the same thing. JP Morgan in the pre-market up by 2.8% this morning, Tom. Wells Fargo up by 3. <coughs> City, after having a look at those numbers, investors bidding that one up by 1.85%. I think most of our audience, including Global Wall Street, knows each of these banks have a character. There's a culture to them that goes from mergers and acquisitions, how Bank of America, John, was pieced together out of 47 banks. Brian Moynihan is a young lad having a lot to do with that on the Northeast Coast and on and on. And there'll be a discussion Monday, Tuesday. On Wednesday, there's not going to be any discussion but the future of the house that Weinberg built. And and I really really think it's going to be really key, the messaging of Goldman Sachs and how it's taken on Wednesday. And David Solomon, the bar's been set so low, Tom. So low. And and there's a heated, I'm going to cut right to the chase, there's a crew that says this guy's been tarred and fettered, Lloyd Blankfein screwed this up, David Solomon didn't. That's the heart of the matter. And I just don't, I, I think Wednesday's maybe more important than we think. At some point you own it though, Tom? Don't yes. You? Oh, yeah. Don't oh, yeah. Own, aren't we at that, I don't, like, aren't and we I don't have an point? opinion on this. I adore Mr. Blankfein. But the bottom line is that's the zeitgeist out there from a certain group. And we'll have to see. I mean, it's all there is to it. Futures have improved. J.P. Morgan alone has lifted futures. Someone who's long on this is Srinath Arajan. He is expert on this for Bloomberg News and doing two things. The zeitgeist of this, yes, but also the reporting. What is the immediate reporting of the future of the leadership of Goldman Sachs? Well, for one, let's look at what J.P. Morgan posted today. And when you have a bank... That's already up 11% this year. The stock's up 11% and goes out there and posts an ROE of 20% and the stock bounces another 3% on top of it. That doesn't set a low bar. That sets a high bar for others to follow. And that is something that will make bankers inside Goldman Sachs sweat today because they have telegraphed. They have made clear that the numbers that they are going to post are going to be pretty bad. ROE will be in the low single digits. It's not Mm -hmm. going to look pretty. They will obviously have to play the game of telling investors and analysts not to look here, but look there. Don't look at Q2. It's two weeks in the past. Look at what's ahead. And it remains to be seen if they can sell the market on that. There's all these rumors out there, which I'm not expert on. What's the train wreck moment here on Marcus? When do they fix Marcus? That's what the street wants. Look, we're nine months into it. They they, they swore by it. They committed to it. They wanted to get big in it. But they also made a 180. They've made a complete about turn there. They've pretty much shed most of the important ways in which they tried to court Main Street, Marcus Lending, all their direct-to-consumer push. Outside of that successful really high-yield savings account, they're pretty much out of it. There's even questions over the future of their partnership with Apple and GM. So it's not going to be a part of the conversation cycle a few quarters down the line, but it still might take up some airtime right now. Sri, you wrote about this earlier this week. How rare is it for the likes of Goldman to come out and set the bar so low? It's it's interesting when you talk to all the analysts from Mike Mayer to David Conrad to everyone else, uh, they don't normally do this. 
Goldman is famously reticent about providing any sort of intra-quarter guidance. Yet this time they've gone out there and talked about the 25% slowdown in trading. They've talked about some very specific hits that they're going to get in the real estate market and uh, about the write down they're going to take from the Green Sky acquisition, which, by the way, was an acquisition they only completed a year ago and are already trying to sell it off. For a firm that's run by expert investment bankers, it's never really been good at doing acquisitions. But here's the bigger issue Have they been able to drive down consensus estimates low enough? Because it's clear from all the body language, it's clear from what they've said publicly and from what we hear from investors and analysts who've been talking to them privately that they're really trying to drive down expectations. Is it a case of under-promise and over-deliver or the more worrying scenario of under-promise and under-deliver? Sure, you said that it was going to be a quarter of saying, don't look at this, look at this. What are they going to say, look at this? I mean, where is the sort of growth that they're going to point to that could come in the future? Green shoots, the favorite term for every okay. investment banker <laughs> in the last few weeks. They will talk about how this might be the trough for investment banking the last few quarters. After the boom that we saw through much of 2021, investment banking has been sliding down. They're hoping Q2 is the trough. Capital markets, hopefully, maybe opening up if with all the numbers we've seen this yeah, week. This is the, I'm going to interrupt you. This is really important. They're hopefully. I don't hear these other banks hopefully. They're not hoping. They have a strategy, a plan. The, 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 the ratios of, every, of, of asset and wealth management for J.P. Morgan is an act of God. Goldman Sachs has an equivalency to Mary Erdos's fiefdom. Does Goldman Sachs going to have those kind of numbers? In asset management? The problem is, again, they have this historical reliance on using their principal, using their balance sheet to make investments. And now this quarter, they're going to see big hits on that. So they will slice and dice. They will try and tell you, ignore the losses that we have from our balance sheet. But if you look at our fee-based revenue, look at the durable growth there, they will try and sell that story. And there is a reason that they have to lean in on hope, uh, Tom, because the other banks can point to a 20% ROE. You just can't go out there and flaunt a 5% ROE and say, this is why you need to believe in the stock. That is why they have to paint a more rosier picture for what lies ahead. Are they done with layoffs? They will not say that. We've had J James Gorman was very specifically asked, are you done with layoffs? And he said, look, we just went through a round of 3,500 job cuts, many managing directors in that rank. We don't think we'll have a reason for more layoffs. Goldman isn't committing and realize that they've already done three rounds of job cuts in the last 12 months. They realize that if the markets don't rebound as quickly as they would like to see, they may have to take more actions because expenses is one thing that they can control if their underlying business is not going on all cylinders. Goldman Sachs coming up on Wednesday, coming up in about seven minutes' time. So we finish on this three. City, what are you and the team looking for from City in a moment? It's, it's a bank under transition, under Jane Fraser Again, you know, don't care so much about the investment bank. They're going, growing their transaction banking business. That remains the focus, that corporate bank, their relations across the world. And, of course, how they're shedding all their assets globally and focusing the bank in a way that will actually start to outperform because the last five years have not been pretty for City. Be honest, when these calls start, are you listening to them or watching Djokovic play? That's exactly where I was going. It depends whether it's before or after 8.30. <laughs> 8.30 Eastern are you, time. Are you going to fly over Novak. Wimbledon? I mean, I mean, you're such a tennis hound. Are you, gonna go, you, you look like you're dressed for JFK to get over there. for The, the problem is John Ferris country will not give me a visa. I don't have a visa to go over to you, the United do Kingdom. Do you need a visa to get into the UK? Yes, that's the problem with that's, an Indian that's, passport. That's John. ridiculous. There is no agreement for you to go on a tourist it's visa. It's un-American. From your lips to God's ears. Wow. So you can't travel, t seriously, I wasn't aware of this, you can't travel from JFK to Heathrow on a tourist visa. Oh, I need a tourist visa. It's but just how hard. easy is that to access? Not that easy. That's insane. I wasn't aware that's of that That's a window, all. that's Isn't a that window, crazy? John, into, into this world we live in. Wow. Yeah. Sri, going to the US Open? Later oh, this summer? Course. No visa there, so yeah, that's easier. I just need to get on the seven train. I saw, I saw you there a few years ago at the same event. Sri, wonderful to catch up. Looking ahead to earnings. Thank you, sir. Sri Nandarajan there of Bloomberg. On the latest, looking out to Goldman coming up next Wednesday. Silly Tom coming up about five minutes. I don't think you're going to hear hope from Jane. I think Jane's going to be chiseled. This is what we're doing. This is a the plan. There's none, going to be none of this hopefulness stuff that Sri alludes to. We'll hear from Goldman Sachs. You're watching Novak later? I, I'm you know, full Danny disclosure. Medvedev. I'm not into it. I, you know, I, I am I going to be glued to it? 
No, but I try out ten thirty. You know, just Emma's watch a couple of games. Watch a couple of games of Alcaraz versus Danny Medvedev. I will. Just like the intensity of Medvedev it. Medvedev beat the American, right? Yeah, just You've watch a few right. games of that, and just yeah. Tom, you'll be impressed. I, I, oh I think no, that's gonna I'm going to be told stick, it's that's amazing. going to be sticky viewing for you. You know, I, I'm just I'm starting to steal up here for Budapest and uh, uh, David Ricardo's you know comeback. I think I'm really excited about it. What is the comparative advantage of? Alpha Tauri. It is. It's a comparative advantage, and oh. his, nice. his 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 Perez. I mean, the, the the David Ricardo against Perez is going to be something. Let's see if we can get Checo yeah. seat. I'll, I'll let you yeah. explain it to me. Not now. Ken Leon of CFRA coming up very shortly to break city earnings. Looking forward to that. We'll do that with Ken, and we're going to catch up with Shanali as well from New York City with Equities Positive. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to another special Wimbledon update for Bloomberg TV and radio. From Tennis Channel, I'm Erin Coscarelli. Marketa Vandrusova became the first unseeded player to reach the ladies' final in the open era with a straight sets win over Alina Svitolina. The Czech star is looking for her maiden Grand Slam crown in London. She'll face last year's runner-up, Anne Shabour, for the title after she edged Irina Sabalenka to punch her ticket into her third career final at the majors. I still believe that we're trending toward a recession because of the labor market. We're not going to have a uh, economy-wide recession. I was of the view that we've been in a rolling recession. Recession is not a guaranteed outcome, but it still looks very highly probable. You're not going to get the right cuts that we're expecting for 2024. Will the Fed do another one and then pause? Likely. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keene. It is an historic earnings day for the big banks, and we move on that into a true bull market. Futures, James Diamond lifts futures up five, down futures up 147. But right now, the starkest of moments is Citigroup coming out. John, we're going to go into this in a moment with Ken Leon. Back to 2007, July, before the crisis of the third week of August of 2007. Since then, JP Morgan per year, up 11% per year. Citigroup per year, down 11% per year. And that's the massive divide between Diamond and Fraser. Jane Fraser over at Citi trying to address those things. Citi right now in the pre-market up by 3%. Here are the headlines. Fixed sales and trading revenue for the second quarter comes in at 4.45% billion US dollars, the estimate 3.51 billion. Second quarter EPS in at 133. There are the headlines I can see on my screen digging through the release. Shanali Basak alongside us around the table. Hey, Shanali. Listen, if you take a look at what Citigroup is posting there, bringing in revenue just above, ex 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 uh, just above expectations. Very sorry. It's okay, you're sitting income. next to me, so it's a lot, you're allowed to do that. Listen, fixed income trading revenue coming in that high is pretty stellar for Citigroup. What is showing you here is Jane Fraser is investing. They're investing in those institutional businesses and punching on all fronts when it comes to that business. When you look at the first thing they tell you is that they've returned $2 billion to capital uh, to shareholders in the form of dividends and repurchases. Why does that matter for Citigroup? Because they we're concerned about their stress capital buffer in the wake of these stress tests. You've already heard JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon talk about higher regulation. We'll hear the same when it comes to Citigroup. We are going to be looking for cost at Citigroup as well as we continue to look at what's happening here. Uh, their total cost of credit is actually lower than the prior quarter. So again, like the other banks, not as bad as things could possibly be out there. But other costs, remember Citigroup has started to lay people off as well. We'll be continuing to look at what they say about severance costs for the look ahead because we've already seen Wells Fargo increase their costs for the quarter. City with better numbers. Tom on Fick. Let's get some more numbers. Investment banking revenue, 774 million US dollars. The estimate TK, 671. The second page on the deck of 39 pages is just simple. They talk about culture and talent, strategic execution, transformation. And to me, the major headline here, among pretty good numbers and a positive day for the big banks as general, no other institution in, in Manhattan is under a transformation like Citigroup. Nothing's equivalent to what we see here with Citigroup. Bit of commentary from Jane Fraser, the CEO. We continue making progress in executing strategy. Shanali, if you could, we'd love you to. 
Can you summarise what is the strategy of Jane Fraser and how it's different to what came before with Corbett? Very quickly, we have Jane Fraser exiting certain markets here, and we're seeing the last of that coming with Banamex as well. That'll take some time, but it's announced, and we're getting there. So we have the first phase really getting to the end for Jane Fraser. We also see her doubling down on wealth management. There has been changes in leadership at that business. To Tom's point all morning, asset, wealth management, this is the money business on Wall Street these days. Citigroup's advantage here is that they are very global already. That is not what you see over at Morgan Stanley. We have Credit Suisse shrinking across the globe. And so Citigroup group in particular would put, be a beneficiary of this, given they already have that global footprint. One quick question I want to get to Ken Lee on. What's so important to me, Shanali, is what Sri Natarajan just said, is Goldman Sachs on Wednesday is surrounded by hope. Does Citigroup have the same desperation of we're hoping this occurs, we're hoping that occurs, or is this a more stable enterprise forward? You're looking at two different banks. You have Citigroup trading at about half of its book value as of this morning. So they really, what you would hope, they have nowhere to go but up at that level. For Goldman Sachs, if you look at the peer group here, their returns on equity that are expected are lower than almost everybody, lower than even Wells Fargo. So next week is going to be a tough week for the investment banks after you saw such a, a big lift <clears throat> for the investment banks. Four point Five billion dollars in fixed income trading at Citigroup is nothing to cry home yeah. about. That number is supposed to be pressured at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Sonali Basic, she'll dive into this and give us some great detail on 39 pages of uh, Citigroup PowerPoint. Joining us right now and continuing to support us is Ken Leon, uh, Director of Equity Research at CFRA. Uh, Ken, I highlighted at the beginning the mass polarity between J.P. Morgan and Citigroup. Is Citigroup a big bank? Uh, Citigroup is an enormous bank, <clears throat> and Jane Fraser has a journey. She's on the right course, but it's in years and not in months, and she would prefer to under-promise and over-deliver. Uh, that narrative changes because we've gone through event-driven selling the non-consumer banks. Banamex was a disappointment because there wasn't a buyer, so by 2025, they're going to take it public. Uh, but it's going to be operational, and Tom... The conversation that we had during the Corbett years and now with Jane Fraser is heavy, heavy investment in technology platform, compliance and regulation. That should begin to improve margins for the business as investors focus on operating performance in 2024. But again, this story is in years, not months. So it's kind of still in the first half of the game, kind of like where we were with Wells Fargo uh, back a few years ago. City reaffirming its full year uh, revenue forecast in a number of slides. We've seen uh, reaffirmation and an upgrade from the likes of J.P. Morgan. As you get the initial results, what are the themes that stick out and who's executing the best? It depends on what area. But, you know, when you say uh, who is firing on all cylinders, it's J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, it's just incredible. And it's really was spearheaded with the investor day a few months ago showing the depth of their management, their strategic plans, and their ability to drive higher return on equity and return of capital. Uh, it's just been incredible. So they've actually moved a few poles ahead of the peer group. Given the fact that the other banks are trying to compete with that, Citigroup strategy coming out, uh, its expenses are about where they had previously thought. FIC came in almost a billion dollars above the revenues that they were expecting, Ken. How much is this upgrading the image of Citigroup in your mind to something that does have a more optimistic trajectory? I think uh, Citigroup's on the, on the right course, but investors have been burnt waiting for Goodell. In, the, in essence of a full turnaround. Jane Fraser has the right strategy. She needs time. And to Shanali's point, when you're trading at such a low uh, price to net tangible book value, there's opportunity. So the question is, this is an attractive value or it's a value trap? Uh, we think it's more promising, but we still have a hold rating on Citigroup. Tell me about wealth management. We're gaga over the J.P. Morgan numbers. Of course, James Gorman at Morgan Stanley acclaimed for his success. Maybe as a generalization, Goldman Sachs struggling. To me, Citigroup wealth management is an enigma. Can she compete? She can, and she uh, has a, a, a strategic plan and new leaders. The strength of uh, city wealth management really has come from Asia, uh, where they are one of the top three players that are uh, from the U.S. But in the uh, 
But in North America, really, it's going to be trying to scale up against the dominant players of Bank of America and Morgan Stanley. Uh, but they see opportunity and their CFOs are telling Citigroup that, of course, if you want to get a higher multiple for your stock, you need more businesses that have recurring revenue and attractive fee income uh, because you can't always play the net interest income rate game all the time. I mean, John, to me, this is just absolutely a germane and maybe of immediate time. We're talking about, again, Goldman Sachs hoping here. How do you hope to compete with a juggernaut like J.P. Morgan, where clearly people are throwing money at them? In the PowerPoint, I don't see that people are throwing money internationally at Citigroup. I could be wrong on that, but it that's can, what I observe. Goldman Sachs, of course, is not Citi. It's not Wells Fargo. It's not J.P. Morgan. Everyone, to Tom's point, has their own identity. Are there points of these releases this morning, though, that might give you some encouragement on certain parts of the business at Goldman to next week? So, I, I, again, they're not small. They are a very top three, top five player in uh, asset management, uh, wealth management. They're, they're way behind, uh, and it's a different business. Um, so I think that's going to be the bright spot, along with uh, areas of transaction services. Uh, but then again, it's the optics and the body language from David Solomon to the point that we do have a strategy we did outperform the S&P 500 since I took over. Only two or three percent of the stock is owned by partners, and I'm serving institutional or public investors. And we're, we're moving on the right course, and we're going to gain wallet share. And they will gain wallet share in the next 12 to 18 months in trading and investment banking. But that's kind of where we were, and we then went off the page with some of these adventures into consumer areas that they have to write down. Ken, do you expect to see dispersion where J.P. Morgan doesn't have to pay for deposits and Citigroup and other big banks have to pay a lot more? Lisa, everybody has to pay for deposits. And, and even, even my mother knows that I can get, she can get a 5% yield. So, I mean, those days are over. Uh, that was a decade of free money or low rate money. Uh, and it's just part of the business. But again, what drives uh, net interest income and net revenue is loan volume. So if we have a, a stable or healthy economy, uh, even with rates and some deposit spreads narrowing, uh, it's a pretty good picture for banks. Ken, wonderful to get your perspective. It always is on earnings season. Just to hear from the likes of Gerald Cassidy of RBC, Ken Leon of CFRA. Ken's going to be with us a few times, I think, over the next week as we work through these bank earnings. So that's it for this morning from the likes of Citi, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan. Now it's on to next week. And so far, so good this earnings season. Take the banks, take Delta, the airlines here in the United States, throw in PepsiCo. Earnings season's been pretty good so far, Tom, in the last 24 hours. There's been a mo I can't wait. I think we have Gina Martin-Adams coming on the back side here and, and talk equity strategy, frankly, through next week as well. And it's just simple. Are we just going to see continued multiple expansion? I mean, I, I just, does the multiple on J.P. Morgan expand? That's also been a criticism of this rally so far this year that a lot of it, Lisa, by the people not in the rally. has been multiples precisely by the people who weren't in this rally. Based on the earnings, the revenues are starting to catch up. The earnings are starting to catch up. And that's what people are watching with really the economy mm. continuing to chug along. And that is really the theme we're hearing from these earnings. Equities right now up by 0.2 percent. Coming up very shortly, Porik Garvey of ING Financial. Looking forward to that. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Stocks are positive, as I said, by 0.2 Coming up very shortly, we'll have a conversation on interest rates and the Federal Reserve. The latest from Andrew Hollenhorst dropping their call for a hike in September, pushing that out potentially to November. They think, Tom, there is a potential here for inflation to pick back up again after a soft patch in September. Well, that was a fan distribution chart from Michael Gapin and the others at Bank of America, like five, six, seven outcomes you get on an inflation path. And I think that the basically the headlines that we've had uh, imply a linear function of disinflation, and the pros are not doing that. They're, some are looking for lower inflation, disinflation. Some are looking for stability, but there is a growing crew saying, okay, at some point we get to where we are, and then maybe we tick up. I just want to bring you this to kind of dovetails this idea of interest rates into the earnings. This from Citigroup, that they had 11 percent jump in revenue from U.S. personal banking led by credit card balances, which helped offset the 78 percent surge in write-offs tied to consumer loans. This the theme that a lot of banks 
are increasing their loans even as they see a weakening in the credit profile because they are earning so much on They're said loans. To it. it's a drug. This it's is a, a fascinating a tension when you start levering up in the heels, on the, you, in the face you, of weakness. What are you making on those charge cards? 20%, did they do that in the United Kingdom, John? What's that sum? 20% interest rate on a charge on credit card. credit cards? Yeah, yeah. 22%? Uh, they're sky high. high. They're, they're, they're sky high in England, too. Yeah, credit card That's like card biblical. Fees. I mean, come Interest on. rates on credit cards are nuts, yeah. When we were in school, nobody talked about 24% charge cards. They're ridiculous. Not everyone can play the points game, where you just spend on your card to get the points and then pay What's it off at the end of the you know, month. Which island do you want to go to next that. weekend? I didn't have a credit card when I was in college, but, you know. I didn't either. We are on track for a soft landing, and I know, you know, the bearish camp would say, well, you look at positioning, and it's getting very exuberant, you know, by some metrics. You look at, you know, whether it's hedge funds, whether it's CTAs, all of those investors have, you know, very quickly, very bullishly positioned. So, you know, that leaves you susceptible to a negative catalyst, but can you name a negative catalyst right now? That was Anastasia Amoroso, Chief Investment Strategist at iCapital, summing up the decent news we've had so far this week, encouraging a market rally but potentially a fifth consecutive session. Your equity market right now on the S&P 500, slightly positive by 0.2%. Doing OK. Let's check out the banks, the financials, those that have reported so far. Citi, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, and have a look at where they're trading. JP Morgan is up by 2.7%. Wells up by 45 Citi up by 0.9%. Just a bit of a correction on Citi. Their fixed income, sales and trading revenue number coming in at $3.53 billion. That is against the estimate of 3.51. Investment banking revenue, $612 million against an estimate of 671. A bit of a correction on those two lines in the last couple of moments. That stock, Tom, still positive for now in the pre-market. We'll bring you more on those corrections as we fade uh, through it, as we wade through it, I should say, this morning as well. I do want to mention the market's up 7. Uh, SPX up 7 points on futures. The VIX stable, 13.68. Uh, this is the conversation of the day for people looking for stability of thought on the rate market and how it folds over to the Fed. Park Garvey said of global debt and rates at ING Financial, and he writes, he's absolutely brilliant what I call collar notes, where he sets up ranges around a 10-year, ranges around a two-year. How have you changed your collar guesses given the glory of what we saw two days ago? Yeah, it's been, it's been an astonishing week, uh, Tom. I love that 0.2% inflation number. Um, annualizes is up 3%. We need to keep that up. 0.1% uh, PPI. Annualizes to below 2%. We need to keep that up. It's rationalized this move back below 4% for the 10-year. That's, that's key. Because when the 10-year got to 4%, it looked really comfortable there. Mm. Really comfortable because the labor market's been so strong. So we've got this pulled down. The big question now is how far can the 10-year fall? And if you know nothing else about bond markets, the way you model the 10-year is you look at the Fed fund strip, you take it out two or three years, and you ask yourself, okay, what's that rate? And you add 30 basis points to it. So what's that rate today? Around 3.7. Add 30, 4%. So what that, what that tells me is that there isn't a huge... Um, room to the downside here. Now, the question is, why is that long-term Fed funds rate so high? Because it was down to 3%, the labor market. The strength of the labor market is preventing rates from really gapping down here. And that's, that's really crucial. If you have weak dollar and you have some form of implied felt a good hope and feeling of wealth creation internationally, at the margin, they've got to buy full faith and credit U.S. paper, right? Isn't that help price up, yield down? Absolutely. I mean, there's this, I mean, if you look at the demand for treasuries over the past three or four weeks, it's been phenomenal. We had auctions this week, which were... Lisa told me repeatedly. Yeah, 10s and 30s tailed a tad, but there's been good demand for duration, good buying. Um, I would suggest that's prevented the 10-year yield from really gapping dramatically above 4%. But, I mean, to go back to your original question, Tom, if we're talking about ranges here, I would still think that the range for the 10-year is 3 to 4%. There isn't a good rationale for breaking dramatically above 4%. We can go above, 
but to, to, to really break dramatically above, I don't see it. And I also don't see a good reason to get below three. And right now, I think there's great difficulty in that 10-year really gapping down here, unless something changes. I mean, if you give me um, a negative payrolls outcome, okay, that changes the game. But give me that first. We're speaking with Park Garvey of ING Financial as we get some of the earnings from the biggest banks, including J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, uh, and Wells Fargo. J.P. Morgan reporting record revenues. All of the bank executives coming out and saying they see strength, albeit they're building some of their credit provisions. Is there an uncomfortable and unreconcilably, uh, unreconcilable uh, tension right now between the strength that we're hearing about from Jamie Dimon and this sort of recessionista feeling that you're seeing in a 10-year with people piling into the long end and expecting gains there. Right. And you see that in the data, Lisa. I mean, the, the labor market is is consistent with what JP is saying about the economy, which is resilient, and we would fully agree with that. You look at the survey information, it tells you something very different. Small business sentiment is on the floor, CEO confidence on the floor, manufacturing PMI on the floor. So all of that is, has traditionally anticipated the recession. But then you look at services, ISM fighting back, housing market fighting back, consumer confidence fighting back. June has been a remarkable month. And interestingly enough, one of the catalysts for the positive June was the banking crisis, the mini, the mini banking crisis we had in March. SVB goes down, rates collapse, the rate discount collapses as, as well risk assets love it. Once they feel secure about the banking story, and it took us about six weeks, risk, we went risk on. You say that you expect this collar of 3 to 4% for the 10-year. Does this suggest that you think that this tension isn't going away, that the disinflationary push that everyone's buying into now is not going to be resolved so cleanly, and that we're going to be toying with this idea of sticky inflation for a longer period of time for several years? Several years tough one, I would say certainly for the next uh, number of quarters. We feel quietly confident that by 2024, we're not going to be worrying about inflation. I mean, unless you're going to give me a shock that I, that I don't know about. But by the time we get to that period, we should be, we should be in decent um, um, condition. Why is that? Demand is beginning to wane. This impact of higher rates and higher inflation will ultimately have an impact on the economy. The external influence is quite weak, China weak, uh, Eurozone technically in recession. All of that is manifesting in a lower inflationary impulse in 2024. So the next couple of quarters will be tough. I mean, the odds are we will get um, a re-rise in headline inflation over the next couple of months. But by the end of the year, we're expecting core inflation to be below 3% and headline inflation to also be below 3%, so quietly confident there. What's your Fed call? Have you changed it? Recently, no. <laughs> have we changed it ever? Absolutely, we have. Um, November, uh, sorry, July, 25 basis point hike, and we think that's it. That's Done it. after July. Done after July. I mean, the, the, there's an argument as to whether the Fed needs to go in July at all. But look, the Fed have effectively told us they'll go in July. The market is discounting it. They will deliver a, a July hike. That really should be it. And Don't expect a repeat of that January news conference. I think it was January, early 2023. Disinflationary process has started. Do you expect him to start talking like that? No, no. The Fed has a definite hawkish rhetoric mandate ahead of it, even if July is the last hike, they've got to keep the pressure on. So we won't know until the September meeting whether July was the peak. And arguably, we won't know until the November meeting, because they skipped in June. So they could skip and set True. and go in November. So the Fed will keep the hawkish rhetoric up right through to November. And it'll be the end of the year before we know whether they actually hiked in July. And whether this soft patch in inflation can continue, persist through the rest of this year. Parag, great as always. Parag Garvey there of ING Financial on the Federal Reserve. On policy, on the data this week, and a little bit on bank earnings as well. Coming up in the next hour, awesome lineup. 
Mohammed Al Erin of Queen's College, Cambridge, weighing in on what we've learned this week in financial markets and the global economy. Laurie Calvacina upgrading her earnings forecast on the S&P 500, upgrading the banks as well, so that's timely. Andrew Slim and bullish for most of this year, still bullish over at Morgan Stanley. Jay Poloski of TPW alongside him as well. Looking forward to that. And David George, I believe, joining us around the opening bell to break down some of these banks from bed research. Hopefully that's enough for you in the next hour on Bloomberg TV from New York City. Equities up by 0.15%. Bloomberg surveillance, I think we need a market check. And of course, that's a bank market check here on a very, very interesting Friday as we stagger to Tuesday and Wednesday next week. Shanali Bass is going to be with us here in a bit. Sort of summarize the theater of the day and the drama of next week is, is well, Lisa, I'm not sure I expected these numbers. Up 3%, up 3.9%, up 1.8% for City Dog. I just did not expect it. Well, they have mixed earnings across the board. They're in the middle of some sort of revamp. I'm still struck by what we saw from J.P. Morgan, another record, increasing expectations for net interest income. Those shares flying, a similar kind of dynamic with Wells Fargo, with the net interest income also very much in focus, up, expected to be up 14 percent year over year by the end of this year versus the 10 percent that it previously expected. The big takeaways Number one, the economy is still strong. Number two, consumers are still spending, albeit yeah. perhaps at a slowing pace. And see, we have a situation where banks are willing to lend on an increasing basis, even if they have to increase their loan loss reserves, because they're making so much money yeah, on the I, other end. I think the credit dynamics we're studying, and I'm not going to do it, but what I'm really focused on here is almost like the idea of people throwing money at money market funds. People are throwing money. At J.P. Morgan, that's sort of that's where I want to go with Shanali here uh, in a bit. Let's do this. John Farrell preparing for the next hour. Dr. O'Arian will darken the door here, no doubt, to talk about Queen Park's Rangers. Uh, futures up eight. They advanced through the morning. Uh, Dow up 169 points. I'm not in the 35,000 watch on the Dow, but boy, are we getting there uh, uh, quickly. What we need now is a reset on the American economy. She's expert with this, with the acuity out of London School of Economics. Pooja Shriram joins us now, U.S. economist at Barclays. You gotta write a weekend note, my deepest sympathies. What's gonna be the theme of the weekend note across the algebra of real GDP? Consumer, investment, government, in this oddity of trade. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. So, you know, we've, um, we've been seeing very strong consumption spending uh, since the beginning of this year, like you know, Lisa pointed out, there is there are signs that perhaps uh, the momentum is slowing, but we're still you know fairly high. Um, so just to give you a sense of the numbers, um, you know, we're tracking uh, GDP in the second quarter at still 1.5 percent, close mm -hmm. to 1.5 percent, and that's that's a resilient economy. Um, I think where we are seeing some signs of weakness is is perhaps in business fixed investment. Um, and that's, you know, supplemented by the data we're getting in terms of manufacturing PMIs. Um, and that that's really where the weakness seems to be building up. Um, and then we're expecting, you know, some drag from from trade. But overall, if I were yeah. to look at GDP, you know, we're still on a fairly strong footing. It's been off off message today for us as we focus on the banks. And it really hasn't come up in the PowerPoints that, that I've seen but what does Barclays, with all of your heritage of studying this in London, say about commercial real estate? I understand it's not going to move the needle on real GDP, but fold a commercial real estate analysis into your American economics. Yeah, fair. So we, we did write about this a while back, um, Tom, and we, of course, focused on office um, CRE. And I think that's where, um, at the time, there was a lot of um, discussion about stresses. Um, but, you know, some of the the takeaways from the note was, uh, look, office CRE is just about one third of all of the CRE um, in the markets. And I think the second is it really depends on, um, you know, how... Uh, the stresses play out. Typically, you'll find that uh, loan maturities are staggered, uh, lease rollovers are staggered, um, and a lot of exposure for CREs is with the smaller banks. Um, so for it to become a macro scenario, we would really need a solid meltdown. And that's something we don't 
see happening at the moment. Pooja, we're talking about the economic backdrop in a week that has been pivotal. It right. has given us both the disinflation narrative that has gotten uh, given a steroidal shot, and everyone seems to be buying it. It's everything is rallying kind of week. We also have earnings from a number of companies, not just the banks, that highlight the strength of the consumer. Mm -hmm. Is this an economy that has any chance of a recession this year? Well, at the look of it, yes, it seems hard to see how the slowdown materializes. Um, but our baseline, Lisa, is that um, it's likely that momentum will slow towards the end of this year. And a lot of that is contingent on the Fed's hawkish rhetoric and further rate tightening. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's hard for us sitting here to now think of how the economy slows. Uh, but we think higher rates will slowly start to bite uh, in towards the third quarter of, of this year. We're seeing some nascent signs of slowing, perhaps, um, in the economy. Um, and we think that with further rate tightening, we should get to a point where we see a mild and shallow recession towards the end of the year. We're seeing that a lot of the banks are increasing their loans to consumers right now. Mm -hmm. They see the money signs because they're getting good interest rates on these loans, even as delinquency rates pick up and they're putting aside more cash for loan losses. How do you watch this? The re-leveraging of the American consumer ahead of what a lot of people are expecting to be a slowdown. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. So we are seeing some signs of stresses in terms of delinquencies, like you pointed out, um, and we think um, you know eventually uh, the U.S. consumer is likely to slow. But you know, just to sort of tie all of this back, it really depends on what happens to the labor markets. Um, you know, we we're seeing strong consumption spending. That's primarily a, a reinforcing cycle of strong labor demand feeding into income, feeding into consumption. So in order for this to slow, what we really need is for labor market conditions to ease. Um, yeah, that, I think that's that's the key point that we we want to see. And I think that's where we're looking at in terms of where consumption spending is headed. What I see in the earnings, we'll talk to Shanali Basic about this in a bit, folks, and then Gina Martin-Adams on this equity surge. Is a bit, and I want to fold this into economics because everybody's telling me hour after hour after hour in the zeitgeist now that the stock market's delinked from the economy, which I'm not sure I buy. What I see here in the PowerPoint from J.P. Morgan is the iconic bank is the rich people are basically throwing money at a financial system, profiting from it, and the haves in America are really doing well. What's a polarity? I think you're really qualified to do this with your work out of India and out of the United Kingdom. You're distant from this, which is great. What's the polarity you perceive in the two Americas or the three Americas that are out there? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good point. Um I think that the, the people in the upper income group are clearly very well positioned in this economy. Uh, very strong balance sheets, um, you know, very strong uh, savings. And I think um, it's it's the perhaps the income percentiles which are in the lower end of the spectrum, which is where the stresses are likely to be felt. Um, you know, <clears throat> of course, we look at aggregate data, Tom, and what that tells us is across the board, people seem to be comfortable to not save um, even in this economy, uh, I think, and that they're benefiting from this yeah. this huge pile of savings, and they're taking yeah. comfort from it. And so, across the spectrum, it seems like you know we are yet to see any cautious sentiment mm -hmm. set in. That's the expense of summer camps mm -hmm. in plural, which is where you see the saving dynamic on a macro basis slip away. Roll over. Roll over. I'm hoping July rolls over into August where we can save ourselves. Pooja Saram, thank you so much. That would bark Barclays with a really nice update. And the, the weekend reading on this, I think, is going to be fascinating. The, the process of notes coming out after this week. The Great Reset, the disinflationary pulse that everybody was seeming to buy into this week, and then what this means about soft landing, how much everyone just pushes out yeah. recession until never, or 2025, or who knows when. She sends notes out. What you don't see from Shanali Basak off camera is she's working away, diving into what, Lisa, 40 pages for each bank, and coming up with summary notes. Is this a celebration today, Shanali Basak, of the prosperity of the haves in America? Is this just a boom economy 
for the kind of people that actually speak to J.P. Morgan? There's a number we haven't talked about yet, Tom, today, and it's this idea that J.P. Morgan bringing in $87 billion in net interest income for the year, that is comfortably more than J.P. Morgan has ever bought in before. And to the point that Lisa's making, this idea that charge-offs are coming back, but not at the same rate. If you look at the biggest banks in America, if you look at the total Federal Reserve data, charge-offs are kind of normalizing here, and it's what J.P. Morgan is telling people that it's a normalization, not a deterioration. But if you look at the data from the Federal Reserve outside of the top 100 commercial banks, that charge-off rate is meaningfully higher. It is more than 7%. It is easily the highest level we've seen since the financial crisis by a landslide. And so you're not seeing the same thing across all the banking system. And J.P. Morgan is consistently coming out as the biggest beneficiary. How much is the net interest income boon that we're seeing pretty much across Wall Street tied to the increase in loans to consumers, to businesses, versus just the deposits that they don't have to pay anything for. They pay 1% and they can cash in on the short-term rate side at 5%, 4.5%. Yeah, it's interesting. You hear J.P. Morgan talking about this as well. Why haven't they raised rates? Because they're not deposit chasing. They are flush with deposits. They don't need that many more of them. And we have seen that natural flight to safety anyways in the last couple of months. So the point that you're making here is that's not the same picture for the regional banks that we're going to hear from next week that are going to have a lot of pressures. If you also look at the lag in the data, I think it's fascinating. If you look, there's this beautiful chart in Wells Fargo's own release here that shows you the drop off in mortgages relative to the other types of loans that people are taking on. And mortgages is really where you see a lot of that problem. When you look at commercial real estate, when you look at the single family mortgages as well, there's an expectation that the delays you're going to see are pretty significant, that the pressure you're going to see there is over quarters and potentially years. Something interesting, you keep on talking about Goldman Sachs. One thing we also haven't talked about is this idea that Goldman might take a $2 billion hit tied to some of its credit products and commercial real estate as well. So they might be a bellwether there when you take a look at what else you might see in terms of pain, again, not just for a Wells Fargo or a Goldman, but the regional banking system as well. Shirley Bassick, thank you so much. Somehow Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, we'll see you again. We've got who? Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America. Yep. Not First, order, First National that. Bank of Bramo will be out with <laughs> the regionals uh, as well. Yes, the, not necessarily no, that one, but, but actually they matter. Don't we agree that what Pacific West says this time around matters? I would agree because how much right? are they really retrenching their lending? And you can say that perhaps that people just want to go to lunch, but they provide right. much more lending than their footprint would suggest in the American economy. Right now, Lisa and I are going to uh, do this, and this happens, folks. And I have had this done to me where I have made a mistake, and Bloomberg has a heritage with the leadership of Matt Winkler of making corrections. Robert Lavelle uh, does the heavy lifting here, Lisa. And off of Citigroup, still nicely elevated off of the previous $47.68. The FIC area, there was a correction there. The investment banking revenue, return on average equity, return on average tangible common equity. So be careful, uh, the sources you see. Uh, today. Futures up five, Dow futures up 153, the VIX 13.72. If you're just joining us, we're looking at the bank earnings today that are really uh, important to get a gauge on the U.S. consumer, on the U.S. economy. And the read, Tom, has been pretty much across the board. Things are going really well still. And for the banks, that means a record revenue at J.P. Morgan. They are, of course, talking about how some of the regulation is overstepping. We're hearing that already from Jamie Dimon. But more importantly, how long can this dynamic continue? If you do have consumers <clears throat> strong, lending is continuing to increase, but those delinquencies and those write-offs also continue to tick higher. My higher. Imp most important interview now, I, I know, Mr. Diamond, you listen religiously to the program. I don't want to talk to Jamie Diamond. I don't want to talk to David Pinto. I, maybe Duly I want noted. to talk to James Gorman. I, I want to talk to Mary at J.P. Morgan. And I don't think there's been nearly enough credit done here. What they've done, and I think what we're going to hear from her behaviorally is in the last six-month crisis, we are now at a point where, and I'm, I'm saying this is a complete uninformed amateur People are throwing money at J.P. Morgan. I think that's the physical, the, um, the behavioral construct here that gets you to a 35 percent uh, return on equity. That number is 
crazy. We just heard that from Schnally. People want to give their money to J.P. Morgan. They don't want to attract more deposits, so they don't need to pay. And that's something that is going to be a very different story next week when we hear from the regional banks where they are offering other products, short-term instruments, and money market five funds. and a half percent yeah. rates. Yeah, that's different from what you're saying at some of the biggest banks. Very interesting. We will continue here again with futures up six, Dow futures up 156. A lot of interest in the market. Dollar weaker is a headline story today. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Key, we're going to continue. Must listen for all of you. Reset to the weekend for Global Wall Street on the equity market you missed. We do that next. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. When you look at the health of the economy and the leverage in the economy, it, the U.S. banking industry has been deleveraged because of what happened in 08, 09, and the U.S. banks are in very strong shape handling what's going on today. And should this economy do a soft landing, and that's the critical piece, then the stocks will do well going over the next 12 months. But if we hit a hard landing, uh, it's going to be very difficult for the banks. Some of you have a younger persuasion it may go, who is that guy on radio and television? He is Gerard Cassidy. He has of many years of experience at uh, Tucker, Anthony, and RL Day, and then this, and then that. And I think he's worked for like 42 firms over the years. He is definitive on the banks, and he has a certain style to his research that's a huge value. We thank uh, Gerard Cassidy for his commitment to Bloomberg Surveillance. He's been great and that he sends along that crate of 12 lobsters every year from Portland, Maine. <laughs> he does not. He does not bribe us they, with lobsters, they, just for the record. To, you know, just set the record straight, lest anyone think otherwise. They show we carry up on, and, Tom. They show up and Mr. Bloomberg walks in the door and goes, what's that smell? Mm, yeah, <laughs> live, crawling there around your is, desk. There it is. Gina Martin-Adams with us right now on a Friday as we reset for your bear market summer as well. Gina Martin-Adams, sell in May and go away. How's that working out? Yeah, not so well. As a matter of fact, we actually published research uh, last week suggesting, look, July is actually one of the seasonally strongest months in the market. So even the sell in May go away sort of notion really ignores the fact that July tends to be very seasonally strong. It tends to be one of the strongest earnings seasons, just quarterly seasonal earnings, seasonal trends tend to work in this month specifically. So it's tough to play those games. Right. Um, you know, cute in summer mm -hmm. just tends not to work particularly well, and particularly, especially when we've seen some broadening really emerge throughout June. Mm -hmm. We've seen the market perform quite well so Take far. Take the world-class fundamentals of Bloomberg Intelligence and drag it into the emotion in our collective memories of the third and fourth week of August. Things always get challenging the end of the summer. Yeah. Are we prepared for that? You know, I don't think the market is necessarily prepared for that because we've been getting more and more optimistic throughout the year. I mean, really, in the spring months, remember, everyone was talking about this really narrow market. It's not particularly optimistic. We've only seen, you know, performance really concentrated in the biggest of the big stocks. That narrative changed a lot in the month of June and continues to change throughout July, where we're seeing small caps finally break out. We're seeing broadening to some of the value-oriented sectors in addition to some of the growth leadership that we've experienced so far this year. Uh, we probably need to continue to see that for the market to perform because we can only sort of land on the shoulders or ride on the shoulders of the giants for so long. As we get closer to the end of August, that's when we'll start to get some real tangible evidence as to what's happening with interest rates as well with respect to the economy. Remember, there's about an 18-month lag between economic performance and interest rate changes. And so we will start to see if there are negative impacts to the economy, we most likely will start to see that late this year and into early 2024. And that's the volatility that we'll have to contend with. But you know, I think the market at large has just started it at a more optimistic sort of tone. Uh, certainly that can continue if we continue to see very strong earnings, as frankly, the earnings from the banks so far have blown away consensus expectations, in particular for that space, which has been so beholden with negative sentiment right now. So let's drill into that. Is this when we're going to start to see people diving into financials? As we heard Anastasia uh, Amoroso coming out and saying she's starting to find appealing uh, that particular sector. 
You know, I think it, we were a long way from that, frankly, because the biggest of the big banks are not where the weakness was expected to be. Certainly, they've been they've did much better than expected, but the real weakness in the financial sector is expected to be in the regionals and some of the smaller banks, which have yet to really discuss. Uh, you know, what's going on with their trends. So I think we need to wait a little bit to get into deeper into earnings season. I think the consumer finance companies could also be incredibly interesting over the course of this earnings season. How are they contending with higher interest rates? Um, how are the consumers? What is the consumer behavior shift in res with respect to higher interest rates? How desperate are consumers to take on debt? We'll get that out of the consumer finance group as well. And then, frankly, when you look at the broad financial sector, insurance is a huge portion of financials at large. It's not just banks. I think we tend to focus a lot on banks as an economic indicator. But insurance companies are really the leaders in the financial space in terms of fundamental trends. They've done, done reasonably well in terms of price trends also. So I want to watch those insurance companies, too, for signs of potential weakness and or strength. Gina, it's been a huge week. Every guest that's come on the set this morning has said, wow, what a week. Perhaps not Monday and Tuesday. But after that, we got a complete reset with our expectations of disinflation taking hold, as well as strength, whether it was lower expect than expected jobless claims or the earnings that we're getting increasingly. How have you reset? Do you think that this has been a sea change kind of week amid the precipice of a downturn in inflation that's set to accelerate? I'd look, no single week makes a huge sea change for me. I mean, we have been talking about inflation ad nauseum for the last two years as the primary driver of equity prices. So for us, the consequential shift really was in the December, January period where we were getting some really clear evidence that inflation was turning from a headwind for stocks into a tailwind. And that's really just continued en masse over the course of the last several months. What we got this week was a confirmation that inflation is still <clears throat> decelerating significantly more than many people had mm -hmm. anticipated. It is relatively contained and it is very supportive of margin conditions, importantly for the S&P 500. So as much as right. you know, we did get confirmation of this this week, it wasn't necessarily a big change for us. It was just a continuation mm -hmm. of the trend. I'd say the one thing that did potentially change this week was initial claims. We did have a pretty significant deceleration there, mm. and I would watch that for continuation as well going forward. Gina, your claim, which goes back to the last time the Red Sox won 10 games in a row, the famous Gina Martin-Adams acclaim is you're in the market. And in the phrase of New England, you're a player. You're always in the market participating. What is the behavioral process of bears now who've been wrong on this bull market run. How do they work out, publish, rationalize over the next, say, four weeks? Yeah, almost to a person, the bear case is made based on higher interest rates, ultimately constraining economic growth. And this goes back to what we were talking about a little, a little bit earlier is there is this um, underlying tension with respect to the traditional relationship between interest rates and the economy. And there is an underlying assumption in the bear case that ultimately, at some point in the future, we don't know when, maybe it's the second half of this year, maybe it's 2024, maybe it's 2025, but there is this underlying um, uncertainty with respect to how will the economy contend with much higher interest rates. That is, the, that is the bear case right now. And that feeds through to several things, such as, oh, interest rates are too high for stocks. Valuations are too high. You hear all of these narratives. Yeah. But really, it is about interest rates. Now, the trouble with this case is, so far, these higher interest rates have only slowed economic growth. And frankly, inflation has been the bigger story that has driven the equity market. Mm -hmm. So maybe ultimately we do have some sort of bearish correction, but until the data tells you that it truly is coming, you have to participate in the equity market. And that is our right. core belief is follow the data, follow the models. What are they telling you right now? The data and the models have been very constructive really since the end of 2022. Gina Martin-Adams, thank you so much. And what we know, folks, is equity animals, Gina Martin-Adams and myself, is the world of Bramo actually has some serious credibility. I don't think this has been said this week, Lisa. Your world of credit absolutely nailed this over the last three months. Credit spreads did not widen out. Credit spreads were optimistic. Corporate credit, as compared to full faith in credit, said, no, we're narrow. There's an optimism. We're bid. Folks, I can't, I got goosebumps, ducky bumps over this, uh, Lisa. Credit 
nailed it this time and once again. In fairness, so did meme stocks, right? I mean, they also gained everything. Oh, yeah, I see gained. Everything was like, there. <laughs> no, but there was there was a real risk on feel as people believed they in this recovery. They're horrible influence you. on many levels. Right now, what we are seeing as we get these bank earnings, though, is a resilience. Although on the margins, some signs that you do see a levering back up right. of the That's consumer. Right. The city CFO said that. Get this. Uh, said credit card average loans rose 14 percent in the quarter. Yeah. People are charging yeah. all of their trips, all of their airplane no. tickets no. for the points, maybe, maybe not, but on their credit cards. Shocked. And the banks are there for that. They say, great, is, you want to pay us 25%? Is, if you is, don't pay, great. Is Citigroup basically Visa? Are they, are they basically a charge card company that has a bolt-on bank? <laughs> well, I won't go that far, but you are seeing okay. an expansion of consumer credit okay. extension. Cut up the plastic this weekend. That's a summary <laughs> yeah. from Bramo. It's for the points. What you need to know is futures advance up nine. Dow futures up 187. Extraordinary. Have a good weekend. Maybe I'll be, am I here Monday? You are. <laughs> That's my understanding. <laughs>